Cool. Do I do I say things now, or do you intro me? Or <laughs> sure, I can. Um, still okay. setting. Um, let me see. All right, seems good. So, um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to workshop. We're here with D Side Pocket, the co-founder of DCG Con Groups Two Hundred One. Um, and yeah, we're here to pick locks today and learn a little bit about lock sport and learn something new. So, without further ado, side. Hello, everyone out there. We're gonna we're gonna be like switching views and doing some sad technical things. So we're gonna see how this goes. I'm gonna see if I can put myself in like a. Let's see. Da, da, da. I'm just trying to see what my options are here. I have a share screen mode. I guess I'll just do with with face stuff because I'm, I'm imagining we're on speaker view right now. So, um, but hi, yes, I am. It's funny. It's referred to as the side pocket. Uh, so I guess a bit of background about myself. I am. Um, I'm one of the two co-founders of uh, DCG 201, formerly known as, and still technically known as DEF CON 201 or DCG 201. We are one of the many DEF CON groups that exist across the country and across the world, kind of similar to the uh, Blacks and Cybersecurity uh, SIG groups that happen throughout the world. Um, and uh, our group normally meets at the third Friday of every month, uh, obviously because of the plague and the fact that uh, police officers will literally be any, anything that has a face on it. Uh, we've been live streaming our uh, meetups and we also do little like shows, including Minds, which I'll get into in a moment. But if you want to know more information about us, because I'd like to get right into all the stuff, um, you can uh, go to our website, which is at defcon201.org. Uh, I'm going to be later on posting links in chat, and I uh, just want to warn that because of the nature of this live stream, at the end, I am going to open up to questions, and that's where I'm going to run back and forth and try to look at text chat and see what's going on, uh, if there's any text chat, but, you know, that's all of that. Uh, some of the, also a little bit of background about myself. Um, so I've been a, a tool member now for uh, a little over a year now. Um, most of my friends have been part of a tool that's known as the the, or, bleh, the open organization of lock pickers, if I remember correctly, because it is 1 p.m. my time and I'm not normally awake, so bear with me. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's a guild of uh, people who enjoy lock sport as well as locksmiths and a, and a bunch of people and similar to the DEF CON groups, they meet up normally in person to pick locks. Obviously no one's been meeting in person because of this pandemic and that's why uh, which you'll see in the moment when I share screen, I start off my own kind of show on Twitch. Um, and uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, I am known in the group as a uh, in tool as a teacher. Yeah, I want to preference before we get into any of this stuff, two major things. One, um, even though I'm not a tool member, this is not a tool sponsored and endorsed screen. That's why I'm not going to do the boring slides I do. I'm going to uh, show off my uh, methods of um, teaching how locks and lock picking works. Um, but even though this is not of tool, uh, the open organization of lock pickers, excuse me there, um, another sit. They have two, whoa, what's going on? Food particle, hello. That's why I get for eating breakfast too late. Um, tool has two very extremely good rules. Um, that we are also going to follow um, during this workshop or any of my workshops, whether I'm doing it for Tool, DCG 201, DEF CON, uh, the US Senate, whatever. And those two rules that we're gonna follow are one, um, do not pick locks that, uh, that you rely on. You, can you not be sick? Um, so it's like, uh, what do you call it? When, uh, uh, that just distracted me. Okay, so don't pick locks that you rely on, um, ergo, um, I've had so many people who come to my or my workshops or just casual meetings and I teach them how lock picking works. And this is why I get for living with roommates. And uh, okay, sorry about that. This is, that's how you know we're doing it live. But um, where they're like, oh, like I know how to do this. I have, a, I have a, my, my door, you know, my lock on my front door or I have this lock I use for my gym locker. And no, don't do that for a couple of reasons. One, as you pick a lock, it wears the lock down and the lock becomes more susceptible to picking and bypass techniques. Um, in addition, um, you always run the risk when you lock pick of breaking your own tools. 
and wearing them down. And the last thing you want is to break off your own tool, thus damaging your door lock. And now you have to replace your door lock and also worry about just people randomly going into your building. So do not pick locks that you rely on. The second thing, and this is probably even bigger, is uh, do not pick locks that you don't own. Um, if you see this workshop or any of my previous stuff or anything in the future, and you're walking around and it's like, oh, sorry, Pocket showed that lock on the air. I have the exact tool that don't, don't do that. You are trespassing from going onto people's property. Uh, that lock was bought by someone else. There's a, probably a good reason, even if it's trivial, why they have that lock on there. It, it's, it'll save your butt, and it will also save my butt because I didn't endorse this. All the locks that you currently see uh, that we're gonna that we're gonna go through are literally part of a giant training kit uh, that I've been building over the course of a year. Um, they are only used uh, for lock picking, and they're not used to secure anything. So they're literally just used. Uh, to not only teach other people, but to gradually teach myself new techniques and how to pick locks better, et cetera. So once again, those two rules, do not pick locks that you rely on and don't pick locks that you don't own. Uh, we're going to go through later on where you can buy pick sets if you are really strapped for cash, how to essentially uh, ways to make tools of your own. And uh, we're also going to go through um, where you can buy practice locks and really good beginner uh, actual real locks that people use in order to use to practice. So what we're going to attempt to do now is I'm going to attempt to try the screen share feature and hopefully not like reveal like any of my personal information or anything. This will be fun. So I'm going to try to start the screen share if I can. Okay. So um, to the host, uh, you've disabled uh, participant screen sharing. Can, can that be undone or do I have to wing it? Hello? Oh, okay, thank you. All right, so we're gonna try. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do first here is I just wanna go through some stuff that I have open in the browser here. And then we're going to go to the table where most of the meat potatoes of this workshop is going to take place. So let's get back to here. Bam. Okay. So yes, yeah, so this is the, uh, geez, why do they do this with the controls on here? Um, let me shrink this down so I can see better. Here we go. So yeah, this is, uh, this is our website. This is why I always land to, to make sure that uh, I don't dox myself. I don't care about these tabs. Um, so as I said, um, this is the uh, Open Organization of Lock Pickers. This is an organization that I've been a part of. I'm actually going to attempt to uh, copy that URL and see if I can post that in the chat. There we go. I think, can we do the paste? There we go. Um, it's at uh, T-O-O-L, that's tool with three O's dot U-S. And they have a lot of resources here um, that you'll be able to use later. And I can always re-go over this. Uh, they have like the meetings, how to join. Uh, it is a paid membership, but it's not a lot, if I remember correctly, uh, provided they haven't changed it, is I believe it's like $20 a year. Uh, when you become a member, uh, you also get to vote. And we're actually going through a voting phase right now. Um, something I wasn't able to put on my blog is uh, they have a uh, whole list of equipment. So, and I'm gonna be completely honest, um, it's a little bit on the, some of the stuff is a little bit on the pricey side. I think the necessary nines are actually really good, but basically you get what you pay for. Uh, all the tool stuff that you ordered is actually done by the individual members. They're basically, when someone orders something, they call them up and then they actually have to build this and then mail it. Uh, and so all of this stuff is, is mostly, most of the stuff is handcrafted and it's really high quality. Um, so if you, you know, if you're ever confused about getting equipment, you can always go to tool and they're pretty much guaranteed to have um, various equipments and swag and stuff. The other thing I want to bring up that I have no idea why this is not on the main page. Let's see if I can get the URL right. Yes, is uh, one, one of the questions that people ask, and this will actually segue into the other thing I was going to bring up, is the legality of um, this sort of activity. Um, so, uh, let's see how I can put this. Uh, so basically as far as we know, even though now the map's gotten a little bit more sketchy in most States, you see all the ones that are green, it is technically legal to do lock picking in, in most places. Um, there are a few exceptions here. Um, so for, uh, Mississippi, 
uh, there's a law here and it lists the exact laws, which is uh, uh, professor may, uh, possessor may have to counter prima facie evidence of intent, but only if their picks are concealed, whatever the heck that means. Cause it's like, you put lock picks in a case, put in your pocket, that's concealed. Like how else are you gonna carry these things? This is how professional locksmiths carry them. Um, Nevada, which is funny because that's where DEF CON is <laughs> located. Uh, also has to counter evidence if they're stopped. Same thing with uh, Ohio. And then the oddest one is for some reason, if I'm correctly, Tennessee has uh, large loss targeting rogue and scammer uh, locksmiths. They're broadly written. And so the criminalization is very iffy. Be cautioned if you're in Tennessee. Um, also the possessor with the trying to counter evidence thing is in Virginia. But otherwise in most of the country, it is uh, legal. Uh, a lot of places are legal and must show intent. This is a list that's constantly updated. Uh, I don't know why this is not on the main page, but I'm going to, if I can, go into the chat again, and I'm going to share, if Zoom will cooperate me, this thing. It's uh, the same URL, uh, T-O-L-U-S uh, dot laws, sorry, uh, T-O-L dot U-S slash laws, so S-L-A-W-S at dot H-T-M-L. And this gives you a list for the United States. If you're from other countries, I apologize. You're gonna have to go and research what your rules uh, are uh, essentially. Um, and this actually allows me to um, segue before we get to the table. And I'm gonna kind of go back and forth between this computer and uh, a couple of times. But um, one of the things I do want to bring up uh, because it's a sad reality, um, which is sort of, again, the reason why I bring up the, the reality of this thing is, uh, and I'm trying to think of where do I even begin. This will actually give me a good time to sip this drink. So, Something I want to get out of the way is that, um, like a lot of places, there is a representation problem when it comes to Locksport community. Um, the Locksport community is not perfect, but I'm dead serious when I say that the Locksport and Lockpicking community, such as uh, Tool, um, is, and when you go to, for example, and I actually should have brought them up. Why? I'm an idiot. Hold on. Let's Reddit, you are my friend. Uh, places like our lock picking, which I will share in a second. These are some of the most awesome people, most welcoming uh, places uh, that you can possibly be. And uh, there, there's a lot of uh, women who are into lock picking, and I've seen people of all different size, shapes, colors. Uh, but there is a representation problem, just like it is with any sort of uh, STEM field. And um, I can literally count not including myself, all of the African-American people that regularly engage in lock sport on one hand. It's not that they don't exist, it's just there's a whole representation thing. And it's not, I mean, again, in any group you're going to counter casual racism, direct racism, sexism, things like that. I've seen very little of it um, with lock sport. And again, it's not that it's like this utopia, um, but it's a lot better than a lot of other uh, hobbies and fields that I'm in. And um, honestly, one of the biggest problems is the same problem with computer hacking and security, which is one of the reasons why I like Blacks and cybersecurity uh, and all these sort of representational groups is the representation part. Um, I've often been asked on my show, which I'm actually going to bring up the, uh, I'll share this later, the little uh, list of all the Master of Unlocking shows that I do every um, first and third Saturday of the, sorry, Sunday of the month. In fact, tomorrow is gonna to be the second episode for this month. And I teach a lot of lock picking stuff. Uh, there's gonna be some unique stuff that you can't get on here that I'm gonna show on here, just good recaps and better teaching. But regardless, um, I've had people ask because normally when you see lock sport stuff, you usually see, and you're gonna see this in a moment, my hands doing things. And um, kind of the issue is that uh, I've had people ask me like, why do I half the time show my face? And I do like the hands only thing because you focus more on the locks and the technique than kind of the identity of the person. It also allows a bit of anonymity. But I on purpose always start and end master of unlocking at minimum uh, talking like this to all of you uh, because, um, because again, uh, I've also been inside, so I've been kind of pale lately. Uh, but obviously when you look at my hair, um, I guess I'll, I don't know if I should, I'll admit. Um, but uh, that I'm obviously not a 
I don't know how the nice way to say is I'll put it this way. I'm mixed. I'm, I'm half African-American, I'm half African, uh, black African and half Polish. Um, but I'm obviously not just generic white Caucasian person in a character generator in like a uh, Skyrim or something like that. And uh, to be fair, a lot of people in Locksport scene, the majority of them are um, Caucasians. They're really awesome people. They're very open, uh, great people to hang out with. And they know this problem. That's why everyone's been trying to figure out ways to reach out and things like that. And that's why I'm honored to be on Black and Cybersecurity to be part of that sort of outreach. And that's why I focus on my face. So you have to see my crazy poof nap hair and everything. Um, because again, I can count as many representation on one hand. And so I do want to shout out real quick before we go to the table. Um, one of those awesome uh, people is uh, Sky Pirate Actual. Um, he's an awesome, uh, if you want to learn um, not only lock picking, but uh, survivalist um, techniques, um, this is your man to go to. Uh, we follow him on our account. Uh, he also teaches courses in his local area. Um, and you know, he's a really awesome person. I'm going to actually put his, he's, I can only really find him on Instagram normally. So I'm just going to share his Instagram and, uh, be, be done with that. Uh, the last thing I want to bring up with, um, representation is again, that's why I brought up the legality. I'm sorry if this is kind of everywhere, but we're going to get to the table in a second is that, um, the thing about also representation, again, that's why I bring up the legal stuff because uh, everyone has their own theories. And one of the reasons why I feel like you don't see a lot of African-Americans in the Locksport community is representation. Um, you know, I know from the hacker scene, for example, every time you see a hacker protagonist, he's always some spiky haired white dude or a white dude or white looking dude in a hoodie. And I've literally had people show up to our uh, DCG 201 meetings and like all these like awesome Latinx and Africans and the, and people of color in general and they do like absolute mind melting stuff like stuff that i don't even know crazy things with cell phones and operating systems and i be like i'm like wow this is really cool hacker stuff and they actually don't they didn't realize what they were doing was hacking and they don't see themselves as hackers because as one person put it and i'm going to try to pardon my french as much as i can um they were like i thought hacking was white people crap because that's all they see in the representation in that field. So they don't even put together that this is something they can actually do for, act, for quite affordability now at home. <laughs> it just doesn't enter their brain. Um, and it's the same thing with Locksport. Um, the more, you know, more women, the more women of color, the more people of color, um, different sexes and backgrounds that we have, the more that are going to come in. And again, it's an open, especially with tools, an open welcome community, but we need those faces out there. And, you know, one of the big problems is waiting for a face to out there that doesn't come. And that's where I've learned over time that if I'm waiting for an African representation, because I want to see it and it doesn't show up, that even though I don't think I'm elite, I, if no one's going to do the rep, at least I know a bit of it. So I have to put myself out there and I've done that and I've seen scenes improve because of that. So that's one of the main reasons I'm here. The other theory real quick is that again, the legality. Um, I will say that's okay. Let's put it this scenario. But don't worry, we're going to get to the lock stuff in a second. If you, um, wow, I just did half the time here. Sorry. If you uh, are, sorry, my brain's biking out. If you, uh, we're gardening in your backyard. Let's just say you have a backyard and um, and then you have to remember to pick up your son uh, or your daughter from like a little league baseball and you get in your car and drive off and then the police pull you over, which is already bad enough. I've been in that scenario, but then they check your car and they see shovels, trowels, dirt and a baseball bat. <laughs> What do you think they're going to think? And it's the same thing with lock picking. Again, you can carry these around and stuff, but be ready that if you are stopped for anything and police pull out lock picks, they're going to have a bunch of questions. And we all know how police, because of training and cognitive biases and just terrible training, um, treat people of color differently than certain other demographics. So uh, I just want to be, I think that's the other reason is, again, African-Americans see something skeevy. They know the stereotype that people default at the African-American uh, perception to being skeevy. Um, this is the reason why, for example, as someone who, I'm sorry to get a little political here, supports uh, 2A, but I hate crazy, stupid people, and there's a ton of that in there. Um, 
that uh, uh, a lot of times when you see trainings and they always show an enemy that you need to be aware of when shooting, it's always African Americans and Latinx people in bandanas. You almost never see Caucasians in bandanas or in gear as target practice. And it's that type of stuff right there. And that's where those type of stereotypes and cognitive biases. It's kind of the same way how I know a lot of um, a lot of my uh, black friends have a thing where they, this is, I think, really kind of silly, but I get the point, where they don't eat like fried chicken in public because they know of the stereotype and they're just afraid of what people think about them in their eyes. And that's actually, I think, the other reason for lock sport. So that's why I wanted to go over, this is a hobby that I do. Um, this is something really fun. Anyone can do it. I've taught, literally, I would say the minimum age probably to get started with this is five to six years old. And, and it's awesome to teach. I've taught old grannies how to do this. In fact, I got into this because my mom, actually learned this stuff before I, I did, uh, before she passed away. And she was like, you know, how old women knit and watch their stories. She would pick locks and watch her stories. So enough of me rambling. You came for locks. So now we're going to try a different screen sharing thing because I'm known as the rambler. And uh, let's see. So I'm going to see if I can switch the new share. There we go. And now we're going to go over to the table. Here we go. Let's try this. Ta-da. Yay. All right. So you're going to watch me move over. And actually, I'm going to hit the focus button. This is a really cool machine that I like that's called an Elmo. It's kind of named after the uh, doll. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, there's not even the whole thing on here. But this is the table. We're going to go through stuff. Oh, I also forgot. Uh, this is kind of a running joke. Safety third. Um, this is part of a much, much larger portable, you can't quite see it because I can't put it in frame, it has a handle and stuff kit that will eventually become essentially two clear suitcases in a trolley. And this is what we're going to go through today. So where do we begin? Well, first of all, um, I'm actually going to show you my, uh, and actually let me move the camera over because uh, even though you don't have the video of this, the audio, I believe, comes from this camera. I'm going to actually double check that real quick. Why are you doing this, Cord? Ah! As I say, F it, we'll do it live. There we go. I just want to double check the audio here. There we go. Hopefully you can still hear me. This should be way better audio. <clears throat> uh, let me know uh, if, if you can't hear me here, but hopefully you should be able to hear me. So this is the setup. And what we're going to first do is I'm going to show the... Uh, this is what's called an EDC or an everyday carry. This is mine. Um, this is made out of uh, just parts and, and uh, various lock picks and equipment over time. And again, if anyone can't hear me, just let me know in uh, chat or just the person who's running this say something. Uh, this is kind of the leather case that I have for this. And I'm just going to show the tools in here. And then I'm going to show you how a lock works. Uh, why they can be picked, and then we're going to pick them, and then we're going to go through a bunch of different locks and lock systems here. So again, this is the EDC Everyday Carry. Um, this is just my personal one. Everyone's is different. A lot of times when you meet uh, lock sporters and lock pickers, um, you will have a thing where uh, uh, everyone takes out their everyday carry. And if you've ever seen that, the movie American Psycho, and they have that scene where they all compare business cards in the most like <laughs> snobbish way, that kind of happens here because everyone's EOD is different. Uh, looking at someone's everyday carry um, kind of gives you a mental window into how, what's, what's someone's specialty in locks, what, what people like to do in locks, their techniques and stuff like that. It's kind of a window into that person's brain. So you kind of get a sneak peek into the window of my brain. So there's a ton of crazy random stuff in here. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to take these out individually here. Some of these I'm going to put to the side. And uh, after I explain how the how locks work, I'm going to go through every single one of these. So right now we're taking off what's called the tension wrenches. I'll explain what those are uh, when we get to that part. And then here's the majority of the tools. And these we're going to ignore because this is actually a thing that resets some of the locks here, just in case I encounter them because they're universal keys. We're going to put that to the side. I'm going to try to try to spread these out more. I'm using the black casing because it's just easier to see these type of silver tools. 
uh, on a black background. And again, uh, I will, I would say this workshop's probably gonna run for roughly another 40 minutes to an hour. And then uh, I will open it uh, for everyone with uh, questions here. Just give me a moment, just plop these down. There we go. So you probably have seen, and the majority of stuff because it's portable are padlocks. You probably have seen these type of locks. This is known as, this is from Master Lock, and this is particularly known as a, come on, focus, as a Master Lock 140. We're going to go directly into that in a bit. Actually, let me see if, do we have enough light if I turn the light off? Now nah, I'm going to leave the light on. Okay, I might turn the light off for close-ups. So what's fascinating is that there's all sorts of mechanics that are going on in here. This specialty design lock that I really need to clean one side at some point, um, this is pretty much what it looks like inside of a lock. This is a see-through plastic lock. You can actually get these online. And this shows you a lot that is in here. I'm trying to get this at a good angle. There we go. So let's go over some terminology here. Some of your, most are just every lock, is, most locks in the United States are like this, and some are unique to padlocks. Um, most locks that you encounter, I would say in America, I would put it at 95 to 97% of all locks. And in Europe and the rest of the world, I would say 92 to 94% of all locks are this type of lock. And this is known as a pin and tumbler lock. Uh, here's the reason why. So that metal bit, you can see it also on the normal padlock here. So you can, because it's clear, you can see it isolated. That is known as the core or the tumbler core. A whole system here is known as the tumbler. Inside the tumbler, and I don't know if we can see it here, I'm gonna to try to do it at the right angle. Let's see if I can get this to focus. But inside at the top, you can see what looks like a little bullet in there. It's the one thing that's not clear, unfortunately. Uh, that little bullet thing is known as a pin. There's two sets of pins in this type of lock. The ones that are in this plug core here are called key pins. Now, one of the things that I love about locks is that every single thing in locks is exact, almost everything is exactly like what it sounds. So the reason why this is they're called key pins is because they literally interact with the key. And unfortunately, right now, I don't have this particular, let's see. Yeah, I don't have this particular key with me. It's floating around somewhere, but I do have the keys for everything else. Um, so the, so the, the little bullets, all of them are lined up at the bottom. They actually engage with the actual key. And this is not the actual key, but this will give you the concept of it. So if you've ever taken out a key, you've looked at it, you see that it has this fat bottom here and it has all these grooves. Those grooves are called bidding. What they do, and I realize this is probably where I need the key for this, is, um, let's see here. Da, da, da. Hey, just give me one moment. I just want to see if I can find the stupid key for this that I have misplaced somewhere because I am not a genius. I think it's, nope, that's something different. I love that I super prepared for this entire talk and I can't find the one thing that would make this work. I think, is this, you, no, that's not it. No. Uh, it's floating around somewhere. Uh, but basically, and I'll show it on a different, I'll actually show it on one of the see-throughs here. Uh, get this one out. So when you put, uh, when you don't have the key in here and you can see on the clear lock, um, the two sets of pins are at different uh, different heights. Sorry, I'm getting discombobbled here. So the, the key, those pins at the bottom, those little bullets are called key pins. They actually physically engage with the bidding and the different heights on the key. Those pins that you see on the top through the clear side of the lock or the cutaway, those are called driver pins because they actually drive up and down in this whole area called the Bible. And there's little springs that constantly push both pins down and that gives tension. Uh, that means that you can, in, you can install these sort of locks uh, right side up, upside down, doesn't matter because there will always be tension in them. It's part of the security system. And so as you can see with this cutaway lock, they're all the, those key pins and driver pins, some of them are high up, some of them are low down, they're all over the place. But if we take the actual key and we put that in the lock, you'll notice that it moves these key pins and driver pins up and down. And you'll notice how all of those driver pins you saw, they're all lined up perfectly straight now. I'm gonna remove the key again, see how, 
Some of them are really low, some of them are really high, but then I put the key in and it's gonna move them all around. And now they're all at the right height. When you have the right key for the lock and it's at the it's bitted to the right way, what's happening here is all the driver pins are on the top of the shear line. That's on top of the little space between the lock body and the plug, if you see that edge that circles around here. So all of those driver pins are all lined up right above where the lock body meets the plug. The key pins are right below it and their tops are also right where that gap is. And that's what it does. It causes a gap between the two pins. They're all lined up because you have the right key and you're able to turn the lock open and close. And that's in a nutshell how locks work. I hope that was clear enough. Again, I will go over the Q&A. People remember this. I'm just gonna put this down because this thing drives me nuts. So what happens if you don't have the key? Well, this is where lock picking comes in. Um, we're gonna, I'm now gonna explain why and by the way, what happens when you turn the core and it, it gauges what's called the actuator. That's this thing that's holding the shackle and the lock and then the shackle, this metal part will pop open. So here's, here's why you can pick most, like pretty much every lock can be picked, especially pin tumbler locks. And I can just demonstrate that by showing up here. So if you see all these holes, these are the holes. It's the same ones that would be drilled in here that you can't see because the lock body is not clear where all those key pins and driver pins are placed with the springs. Now you might notice something here. Even with today's lock methods where these are done by machines, no lock, almost no lock has it where these are lined up straight. So these are not in a straight line. You'll notice, you notice that like that top one is slightly to the left. That one is very much to the right side. That one's a little bit to the right. That one's super to the right. This one's kind of in the middle. That one's super to the right. And that one's a little to the left. They're not lined up straight. And I can actually jingle the springs around in there. What that means is that when you turn this plug, even though there's no key in it, all of these pins, especially the driver pins are going to seize, AKA bind. They're gonna get caught on that shear line. And so what you're doing with the picks is you're replicating the key. You're having one tool that's gonna to turn the plug and seize up all those pins. You're going to have the other tools that are gonna move these pins up and once they all hit the shear line, it's going to turn and open just like if you have used the key. So what tools do you need to use for that? Well, the first thing you're going to need are turning tools. Sometimes they're called tension tools. There's two different types. Um, for today, for the most part, except for certain cases, we're going to be using these guys. These are what are known as bottom of the keyway uh, tensioners. They are called that because, and this is why I love locks, like they say, they fit into the bottom portion of the keyway. And that way you deal, you have the, the your lock picking tool that picks the pins, single pin pick as it's called, or SPP above it, and you tension below. So that goes at the bottom. Uh, there's a lot of different designs. These are known as L wrenches and they have a little twist in them because I, I just personally find that more comfortable. Some of them are called Z wrenches where they're shaped like a Z. There's many different types. This is just one example, but they all work at the bottom of the keyway. These guys over here, which you'll sometimes see me use for different types of lock are known as, sometimes they're called pry bars, but often they're known as top of the keyway tensioners. And exactly like what the name says, they are called that because they stick into the top. They have like a little groove at the top on their body and they stick at the top of the keyway. So you tension it at the top and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. A lot of times when people pick high security locks, they use top of the keyway tensioners or pry bars. Um, and that's simply because uh, using top of the keyway gives you more room to work with. And a lot of times with high security locks, we'll get into that in a moment. The keyway is smaller than average. So you need as much space as you can get to fit the tools and work them in. Um, the bottom of the keyway tensioners are not only just good for beginners and overall locks, but we're gonna get into a bit into what's called raking. And if you have top of the keyway tensioners, you're pretty much guaranteed to accidentally pull the tensioner out when you're doing the raking techniques. But so that's that's kind of like the plus and minuses. Regardless, we're not gonna focus on these pry bars because this is the beginner course. We're going to be focusing on these simple bomb the keyway tensioners. And they also come in different sizes and thicknesses. Like sometimes I use the bigger one if I need more comfort or more fine tuning with the amount of tension because a lot of this, a lot of times, even when you're advanced and you can't pick a lock well, it's usually because there's something off of the tensioning. You probably have something too little, too light. 
uh, for these beginner locks that you'll be buying and practicing at home. Uh, I'm going to tell you the exact type of tension. I'm just going to step away real quick and check in chat. Okay, so no one's complaining at me yet. So I believe we are good. I believe everyone can hear me. So that's the first thing we're going to use is the bottom of the keyway tensioner. And the reason why we're going to do that is we're going to put it at the bottom of the keyway. And what we're going to do is we're going to press down on it. And that turns that plug core. And that's going to seize all the pins in here so that we can pick them properly. Now, there are many different ways to hold and tension it. I might hold this in a weird way just so you can see what's going on in here. Okay. But I'm going to show you, honestly, my favorite best professional way to hold the hold a lock and tensioner, especially a padlock. So if you have a padlock and you can do this, you're going to take the padlock, you're going to find the top. You'll know that because when you look in the lock, you'll see that key pin on the top. And when it kind of S's, there's a point at the top. That's the top of the lock. Like wherever, wherever the grooves of the key face upwards and where that key pin is, that's the top of the lock. So you know that this part here, this is the top. You're going to take that and you're going to take your non-dominant hand, in this case, I'm right-handed, so it's gonna be my left hand. If you were left-handed, you would use your right hand. So you take your non-dominant hand, and you're gonna stick that top of the padlock into the meat of your hand between your index finger and your thumb. And then you're gonna curve your thumb around it so that you can hold the lock body as so. And then you're gonna take your tension wrench, in this case, it's the bottom of the keyway. You put that in the bottom of the keyway, right? That's away from the key pin. Wrap the rest of your hand around it, and you're going to then press on the end of it. This will not only give you the best tension and most amount of range, it's also the most comfortable for picking locks over time because eventually your hands will cramp. That's actually one of the reasons why I have this sort of like grip workout thing. It also kind of is like a hand soother. If your hands ever get arthritis, and mine's definitely do, you're not in a life live or die situation, I assume, especially if you're practicing like this. Relax, take a break, um, go watch something, go do something else, take a nap, come back when your hands are not arthritis filled and work on it. Take your time with this. I'm actually just gonna use the thicker one here just because it's a bit more fitting for the lock. So that's how you'll do it. You're gonna probably see me in these demos, hold it like this. And while you can do it that way, this is literally for demonstration purposes so I can show the inside. But the best method for padlocks, which is what you're gonna be mainly working on, is putting in the meat of your hand, wrapping your thumb and hand around the body, and then using your index finger, the tip of it, to do that tension. How much tension do you do? Well, when, if we're in person, I'd be able to poke you and basically you'd feel the amount. But let me describe it. For all of you visual learners out there, I'm going to show you something. Um, if you're vi very visual, so that right now I just have the tool in here. I'm going to press down on the tension. You see how it turns? And at one point, it just stops turning. Like I'm still putting pressure. It's not going to move. As soon as when you push down and that core turns and it stops, that's when you stop doing tension. That's the amount of tension. If you're a more conceptual learner, take a piece of paper. Hold it up against the wall with a fingertip. And the minimum amount that you need to hold that piece of paper up to the wall with your fingertip, that's how much pressure. This is what is known as lightweight or feather ten uh, tension. It, we don't really have a number scale. It's very hard to describe tension. I often say that lock picking because of tension is a lot like being a Jedi, where a lot of times it's like, if you have to feel for it, use the force, because we have no real good descriptors because of the way all of this works. And again, on a real lock, you won't be able to see in here. And you're going to hear some of this stuff on the camera. At some points, I'm actually going to hold the lock up to the camera off screen, and you'll be able to hear things. But most of the time, you're going to be feeling stuff. So newbie tip to avoid, don't look into the lock as you're picking it, because there's no point. After that first pin, you can't see anything else. You're going to kind of hold it off to the side, and you're going to feel for it. And if you're in a quiet room, and you don't have your kids screaming, you're going to hear it. So back to the tensioning. So again, we have our bottom of the keyway tension. It's going to be pushed down. And now I'm going to hold it in the wrong but good for demo purposes way. And the other tools now you're going to use are the tools that are going to re replicate the bidding of the lock, where we push these key pins and driver pins up and down. Now, let me see if I have another one of these in here. I don't. I think I have one over Actually, I can get one out of, uh, this is also a lock picking case. This is actually one of our members cases. They're not the best picks, but they actually have pick profiles that I don't have. So that's why I stole it from him and are using it. 
Uh, here we go. So here are kind of the two profiles that you can use. Now, most pickers use this type of profile here that is on the right. This is known as a short hook. The family type is known as a hook. And it's called that because it looks like a little hook. And off on the side of the camera, there are hooks of different types and widths and sizes and stuff, but all of them are that same kind of curved Captain Hook-like design, hence the name hooks. And that's what most are going to use. And that's pretty much every kit that I'm gonna recommend is going to come with some form of hook, usually a short hook. The other type, which is actually where I learned how to start lock picking, this is known as a half diamond because that little triangle peak, if you had another one opposite of it, it look, would make a diamond. So it's called a half diamond. Some people call it also a triangle or a wedge, but it's more commonly known as a half diamond. Um, both of these work fine. Most of the time, I mean, I think hooks have more range, but it's really more of a preference. I know experienced lock pickers who only use half diamonds. I know some who only use hooks. And there's a really cool technique you can actually do with a half diamond that I'm going to show you later. But for now, we're going to do the short hook. So back to the padlock again. Again, we have it in the correct position. We're going to tension. Just assume that because now I'm going to do the stupid way of holding it just so that I can show you all what everything looks like inside. I'm going to try to get to focus here. Right again. I love the Elmo, but I have to constantly focus this thing. So now that I have the tension on this, that featherweight tension, we're going to go in the hook. And we're going to go into the lock body here. So I'm going to put it in the keyway. And you're going to see that I am, and I have to readjust this. There we go. I am going in and I can move each individual. Let me get a better angle here. Let's try. There we go. You can see that I can move each individual pin up and down in here. I hope you all can see that at home. I'm gonna do one more focus. Actually, let me see if that works. Nah, it's two. All right, I'm gonna do one more focus. Okay, so hopefully you're able to, I'm gonna to try to do a good angle here. You'll be able to see this at home is that I can go in, I can lift each individual pin up. So again, we're gonna do that featherweight tension. So the course rotated, all these are seized up. And what I'm doing here is I'm gonna move these pins up and down. Now, simple technique, as I say, you treat these key pins and driver pins like your siblings, keep poking at them until they give up. More specifically, remember how I said all those holes that are drilled in are uneven? You're gonna feel the pins and some of them are gonna be loose, but some of them will actually not really move and we'll push back. Sorry, I'm just trying to get like the best angle on this light. There we go. So when you feel one that just is stubborn and doesn't want to move, that's the one you're going to want to push up until you hear or you're going to feel a snap. And if you're in a quiet spot, you're going to hear a snap. You're not going to hear it on this because this is a crappy lock. And when that's put into place, then you move to the next one. Some of them will be loose. Then there'll be that one that doesn't want to move. You move that one up and you keep doing that. And eventually the core will just turn and open. And so we're going to do that. So I'm going to put the lightweight tension on. I'm going to go in, move that guy in position. That guy's in position. You heard that? I don't know if you heard that snap. That was That's the second snap that put in position. We have one or two more pins to go. Just one more pin in the front and it opened. Core turned, we moved the actuator and it opened. I'm gonna try that again. And then I'm gonna do one off screen or kind of bring the camera, try to bring the camera closer so the microphone can pick it up. So again, we're gonna put that lightweight tension on it. And we're gonna go, and that one's stubborn. I click that one to place. And now I'm gonna shut up and we're gonna click the rest of them into place. And we got an open. One more time and hopefully you should be able to hear this. Let's see, can I bring this? Yes, I can bring it closer, awesome. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this here. You'll hear it a lot better on the real locks. And we got it open. And that's all there is to it really, is you are just doing tension so that it seizes up these pins. And because of the manufacturer flow with the drill here, you're gonna go in 
and you're going to line all these pins up at the shear line. Obviously, it wouldn't be clear, so you won't be able to see this. You'll feel the clicks, the tension, uh, so the resistance of the different pins that don't want to move, push them into place, and it opens. Now, let's go into some other things here. So first of all, this is a clear padlock. What happens if you have, you know, when you encounter a normal lock, obviously, and these practice locks that we're going to show in a moment, they, they, the numbers are the amount of pins. How do you know how many pins are in this thing? You don't know. There's a way to find out. I'm always shocked that tool members don't teach this. Don't put, you just take a, any tool that has a completely flat edge on it, like this half diamond. See, here's another great use for the half diamond that's not picking related. And you put it all the way in the back of the lock and you push up, that will push all the pins up. And then you're gonna very slowly pull it out. And not only are you gonna feel the pins drop and you're gonna count each drop, one drop is one pin, you're gonna hear it. And hopefully you'll be able to hear it on camera. So here we go, pulling it out. Hear that? That was four pin drops. Here we go, I'm gonna count them with you. One, two, three, four. That's how you do that for any lock. You can do that for door locks. And by the way, same technique uh, I show here also works at door locks. Uh, the only thing about door locks is that you have to be wary where the bolt is facing. If it, you have to turn the opposite direction on the bolt. So if the bolt is to the right of the, the left of the lock, you wanna tension it away so clockwise. If the bolt is on the right side of the lock, you want to tension it counterclockwise. You're pulling away. For pretty much every padlock, um, all, you, it's all clockwise. So that's how that works. Um, and I'm actually going to show you the drop thing with the actual clear lock here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's what you're doing inside the lock. That's how you're able to count. Um, just wanted to get that out of the way because now we're going to get into all the other different types of tools that could open locks. So we went over the, uh, where'd I put it? We went over the short hook and we've also gone over, uh, actually we need to go over the half diamond. I can show you, you can pick this the exact same way you would with the hook. Do the wrong tension position here and focus. So you use that tip of the diamond facing up towards the pins. You go in and you move each pin into their position and you get an open. Now here's a, something you can really, that's cool, that you could do with a half diamond in particular. It's a method called zipping. This, this, is, the, this, is, the, this is basically like a bipe, this is a, a raking technique essentially, because uh, we're gonna get into uh, rakes next. So what you do is you do the same amount of tension you put the, the half diamond all the way in the back, you lift it up slightly, and then you're going to pull it out and that zips because you're going to hear it go zip. It's going to rattle all these pins into place. So you put in, sometimes you have to do it a couple of times. And that opens. So that was kind of crazy, huh? What was that raking? That, what did I just do? What was that raking thing I was talking about? Well, let's move this microphone back. The other half of a lot of lock picking kits that you're going to purchase uh, involve rakes, lots and lots of rakes. In fact, one of a, a common mistake and a common student that I often get is I know a lot of people who started off raking locks at first. And then the issue is, you know, well, if these are so, if these locks are easy to rake, why don't we just have kits with just these rakes? Why don't we even bother with hooks and half diamonds? And that's because when you get to higher security locks, the security features in here are resistant, very much so, to raking techniques, which means we've probably seen this if you watch lock picking lawyer and stuff, to do pretty much high security locks or locks with any form of real security, you're going to actually need to learn how to single pin pick. So these people basically learn how to walk before they learn how to crawl. And that's why me and other good tool members teach single pin picking first with hooks and uh, half diamonds before we teach you raking because raking is kind of like cheating, but in a good way. And it, they, raking works really good for cheapo locks and certain types of locks. But once you get to high security, you're going to need to learn how to crawl before you know how to walk. And that's single pin picking. Single pin picking, no matter what lock you do, will always work.
But let's take a look at rakes. In your kit, you're probably going to see a lot of galaxy of all these sort of crazy rakes. And you're probably wondering what they do. Well, if single pin picking are like exact methods of attack, this is what's called a generic kinetic attack. I know that's a lot of mouthful, but hear me out. So for all of you who have backgrounds in cybersecurity, you probably have known something where it's like, um, what you might call it, where like, okay, maybe you have like a program, like a tool in your sit that you put in a specific URL with these parameters and it scans in or tries to exploit that URL. That would be the equivalent of single pin picking. Rakes, on the other hand, are like your tool set on red, on like let's say red teaming, where you enter an IP range or you point it at a overall network, like you facebook.com, and it will scan and try to brute force every single URL, IP address, net, net uh, MAC address, and everything on that network as a general just shotgun. Pfft. That's basically what rakes kind of are, if you understand it with cybersecurity. Um, they work on the same method as single pin picking. Again, these whole drills aren't even, and that's what they're relying on. But as we showed with zipping, what they do instead is instead of going through every single pin, what it's going to do is it's going to shake and rattle all these pins, and they vibrate in place to the shear line because basically pins always want to set to the shear line. You just have to give them a little oomph, and it will open. Hence why it's known as a kinetic attack, because this is going to be very vigorous. Uh, the two overall kind of rakes that you can find is you have uh, your S rake and your peak rakes. So the one on the left is known as a S rake, sometimes referred to as a snake rake. You can kind of see that because it's, it's like a little wiggle. There's like two humps, a big hump and a smaller hump. And if I turn it over this way, it kind of looks like a bizarro version of a letter S in the English language. The other one here, and this one's a triple peak, uh, I also have what's a double peak. A lot of times the triple peaks are often called bogatas, which is one of my favorite lock picking words in there. Bogata. Um, these have multiple bumps in them and they rattle the keys. Uh, sorry, they rattle the pins in the lock. These basically though, have the same methodology in order for them to work because there's another rake that uses a different type of methodology. So as I focus in again, come on. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. We're going to use the S rake here. And I will say by experience, the S rake works better on locks that have four or less pins and really small keyways. Usually if this is a six pin, the clear lock I'm holding, I would either use the triple peak Bogota or the next rake that I'm going into just because it covers more pins. It's kind of more difficult to do it with this smaller S rake. But what we're going to do is it's the same type of tension, the featherweight tension. And it's going to be the two hubs are going to be pointing towards the key pin. So hubs facing the top of the lock. We're going to put that in. And what's going to happen here is I'm going to move this back and forth. That's going to rattle all the keys. And, sorry, rattle all the keys. Rattle all the key pins and driver pins to the shear line. And then it's going to open because we have the tension going. Now, here's how you do the rubbing back and forth. It's the exact same pressure and scrubbing motion of brushing your teeth. So again, we're going to put that featherweight tension on there, a lightweight tension. And I'm going to go in. You're going to get, you're going to be going do, 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 and it's just going to pop open. So here we go. That's how fast it is. <laughs> this is why, especially after you do single pin picking, once you progress to rakes, and I recommend doing single pin picking first to practice with. This really does feel like cheating. Uh, this is also why, again, you don't we don't teach raking first because you feel like a god and you get overconfident and everything. And then when you get to a lock that actually has security, you just fall apart like a flat in a cupboard. So I'm going to try to do it a little bit slower. I'm going to put that tension on. I'm going to put the S rake in again, back and forth brushing motion. And we got it open. As you saw all those pins jiggle around in there, they eventually reached the shear line. The triple double peaks, same technique. We're going to put that lightweight tension on in there. And then we're going to go in and we're going to do a scrub. And because the triple peak is longer than the S-rake, this will probably open even faster. Keyword is probably because again, lock score is not exact science. Try that again. Oh boy, it's big camera shy. What is going on? Yeah, not exact science. Uh, while I'm doing this, up oh, there we go. So you, <laughs> you just have to do this a couple of times. You probably have noticed that when I was doing that, I often let go of the tension, let all the pins drop and do it again. Uh, if when you do the scrubbing stuff, 
if it doesn't open within the first couple of seconds when you're raking, release all the tension and try again. Same thing if you're single pin picking. If you feel like you've picked all the pins and it's not opening, that means you've overset it a pin. Uh, oversetting is when basically you push the entire pin, the key pin and driver pin way above the shear line. And now nothing is going to move. Just like nothing, it's not going anywhere. So in order to correct that, you have to basically reset the pins by releasing the tension and doing it again. That's why when you see me doing these raking techniques, you're constantly seeing me uh, open and not open again. And also the other problem, dead serious, with me doing this is the way I am holding this because I'm literally holding this so that you folks at home can see me do this. Uh, the normal technique that I would use is this, which opens it immediately, but you can't see anything. Now there's another type of rake, and then we're gonna go into some practice locks and real world locks, and then I'll take questions. Um, this guy here, this this gal, guy, whatever you wanna call him, uh, you can name your, uh, you can gender your lock picks or not gender them any way you want because they are yours and you bought them. This one in the middle here, let me take the rest of these off, is known as a city rake, more uncommonly known as an L rake. Now, unlike the other locks, the lot of the lock picks I showed you, I have not found um, why they actually call this a city rake. Uh, I've heard different theories. Some think it's because it resembles a city skyline with all of these ridges. Um, some think because uh, these were commonly first introduced in city environments, such as New York and LA. Um, no one really knows as far as I can tell, but that's what's commonly known as is a city rake. And they have a slightly different technique and they, they it's still kinetic, but they use something kind of different here. So if I take a key, let's find a good one. Let me actually just take this one out. And I hold the city rake up to this, this, this generic key. You will notice that the pattern on the city rake kind of matches the bidding of the key. And basically like that one is pretty much exactly right there if I move it around a bit. And that is because the city rake is basically the most common peaks and valleys of biddings on keys. It's basically a bootleg, and I'll get to this at the end, uh, bump key. And what you are doing is you're not doing the scrubbing motion. If you do the scrubbing motion, you will ruin and break the city rake. What you're doing instead is you're rocking it back and forth up and down and moving it a little bit in and out. So you're not scraping, you are rocking it up and down and that jiggles different pins like it would with the key bidding and then it will open. So again, we're gonna put that same tension. Remember, this is all the same tension. I'm gonna wiggle it and this covers more pins and that actually pin over set. So I'm gonna retension it. And we got an open. We're gonna do that one more time. And then we're gonna go into some practice and real world locks. And we're then I'm then gonna take questions. So I'm wiggling around and it opens. So those are the two main types, just like how we have the half diamond and the hooks for the two main types of single pin picks. The common ones that you will often see if I remembered where I put them uh, for rakes, where did I put them? Oh man, I turned 34 next Friday and I've been having senior moments this past week now and probably in the future. But, uh, geez, where did I put them? Oh Lord, oh, they're over here. I am the stupid. See, that's what I always tell the people at Locks. If a schmuck like me, who's an idiot can do this, anyone can do this. So these are the three common rake types. These are kinetic attacks. You have your S rake, sometimes a snake rake. Your different peaks, uh, the, the, there's double peaks, triple peaks, more than that. These are often also called Bogotas and your city rake or L rake. The S rake and the peak rakes are scrubbing back and forth like you're brushing your teeth. The city rake is a rocking up and down. You do not scrub with it. It's up and down motion, rocking back and forth. All of these are rakes and all of them use the same kinetic attacks and you should get into these with your kits when you buy them. Uh, after you learn how to single pin pick, because you have to crawl before you know how to walk and walk before you know how to run. Before we get into the real locks, I also want to show you this guy. I got this one from China, as they say. Um, this is sometimes you'll see really weird picks, and sometimes I don't even know what they're used for. But this one I, I know for this actually has a name. It's called the stiletto. And the reason why it's called the stiletto is because if I hold it like this and put my finger there, oh, 
it looks like a little stiletto shoe, doesn't it? See? Doesn't that, you see like the tip of the shoe and the heel and everything? And this is known as, and this is more of an advanced thing, a hybrid pick. Meaning, I'm gonna hold it close. You'll notice that when I turn it up this way, you see that little tip up there, if I angle it correct, this tip kind of looks like a little hook, doesn't it? I can single pin pick with that hook. I can also zip the lock like I would with a um, half diamond. But if I turn it around, and you'll notice there's two peaks and these look similar to the two peaks of my two peak um, peak rake uh, set that I have here. And that's why this is called a hybrid pick. Hybrid picks often have a single pin picking side and a raking side. And you don't have to be bothered with this. I just thought I would show it off if you ever see in your kit, if you see a weird shaped one, that's why. Um, and what they're used for is mainly in, for competitions because lock sporters, when there's not a play going around, have them. And what you do is use the bumpy side, the peaks to, and I can actually just fully rake this if I want, but you do that to rake everything and you put uh, like this six pins, it just put four or five of these in what's called a full set. So they're already at the shear line. And then I flip it upside down and I use that peak end and I single pin pick the remaining pins so that it opens. And it's way faster that instead of just mythology single pin picking, if you just uh, rake, pick two pins open. So I just wanted to show that's why I have a weird one in my kit. So as we went over, we went over that there are, that there's two ways that have basically how with the inside of a lock, how it works. Um, we went over the different terminology, uh, why, which is these drill holes are not lined up properly. You can exploit a lock. Um, the two types of lock picks you will get in a set, which are tension tools and picking tools that come in two varieties each, um, top of the keyway, bottom of the keyway tensioners and single pin picks such as the short hook and rakes like this double peak. So the last segment we're gonna do here, the two last ones is we're gonna go over some real world locks and um, then we're going to, I'm gonna quickly show you about combination locks and then we're gonna take questions and I'm sorry for lasting more than an hour, but I blab too much, so here we go. So I have this in my recommendation saying, don't worry, lock picking can get really expensive. I literally probably this, just this alone, never mind some of the stuff I didn't bring out from this kit next to me, is probably multiple hundreds of dollars. Like literally, I probably spent somewhere between like $300 and $500 just to make the training kit for everybody to use in person or when I do these type of presentations. Um, but here's the key. If you know how to shop and you know what you're doing, it does not have to be that expensive. When I started off, well, to be fair, I was gifted a lockpick kit. But even then, I figured out where to shop for cheap stuff. I, I, you know, it's cheap but it works. And I learned how to do techniques at home in order to make this sort of stuff. Um, I'll give you an example. If you are dead broke, and that's another thing, hate to do this stereotype, but again, people from all different types, not just African-Americans, would probably not have money to do a bunch of stuff. So if you have to DIY this at home, um, metal windshield wipers is literally, uh, the win metal windshield wiper inserts, you can get them at like auto part places, is literally what these, tension tools are made out of. You just grab it, make a bend in it. That's that L shape. You have a tension tool. The way you can get make actual lock picks, and if we have time, I will show you this. You can go and get a set of bobby pins. I'll, I'll show this at the end as a bonus, but you can literally take bobby pins. Now they'll only probably work like three or four times, but you can completely pick a lock with just standard bobby pins. You take two of them, you do two quick modifications with them, and you have a tiny pick set that you can use to pick any of the locks that you see here, okay? So let's get into some stuff. So probably the most expensive things, believe it or not, is you can go out and you can get what are called practice locks. There's many different varieties. I have two rows here. This first row is from Tool itself. Uh, they're quality, uh, but they, they do cost $80. So they're a little expensive. And this is basically like if I was able to break open this master lock number three, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, this is literally what the core itself looks like inside the lock. <laughs> so that's all these are. These are just core tumblers from your average padlock, and we've modified them. Uh, the, the 
the tool ones go from one pin to six pin. The one pin I usually use for demonstration and to get people to know how to feel. And these awesome ones for $40 from Lockpick Extreme, both of them are awesome, but these are awesome, uh, go from two to six pins. And it's the same techniques. And the reason why you'd want to, I would highly recommend if you can afford it to get um, progressive uh, practice locks is because this one's called base two. Same thing with the lockpick extreme. That two means there's two pins. It's the, there's two pins in the front. Actually, I'm going to take the half diamond even before I do the tension. And I can show you that it's two pins here. Let's move the microphone up. So we're going to put that flat edge in. Push every, oh, let me take the tensioner up. We're going to push all the pins up. Ah, I'm having a day. There we go. Pull back slowly. One, two. Those were the two pins. And two pins is really easy to start off with. It's a great way to start off with. I started off with two pins. And you're going to do the same tension with your shallow hook, and you're going to move those two pins. Now, I will tell you something really, really funny. Um, Sometimes if you're picking, if you're good, I just opened it. If you're a good lock picker and you've, uh, and you've been picking high security, stupid, stupid advanced locks for a while, and you go to even like the two pin set, you will for no reason not be able to open up the two pin set because you, you're so used to the security stuff that you forgot how the basic pins work. So I often come back and try these. Now, if you do get a practice set, what I would say is you get like, let's say your base two open. Good. Set it back so it locks up again and do it again. Because sometimes when you get it the first time, it's a fluke. And I usually, when I train people with these, is I have them, I have them do it two to three times. And then once they do it about like three times, then I make them go the next number. And I'm like stupid struggling here because I'm not. And here's the thing. I I'm trying to pay attention right now. I actually probably need for me personally for this, the shorter tension wrench. Um, but I will often say that for a lot of times people are often over tensioning because they're way too tense. So I actually recommend watching like YouTube or TV or whatever, or other video activities, or even have a beer. And that way you relax and tension up so you can open these things. And just because the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the two pins. I can normally, I'm probably going to pick these while I answer questions but I've just wanted to go through to show that. So let's say we pick this three times, then we go to the three pin one. The, tension. the other problem I have with my own practice ones is that I really need to go in and, and like put lube on them. <laughs> That's actually why I normally do the, um, recently I've been just doing the uh, lock pick extreme ones just because uh, I need to properly lubricate these because again, as you pick locks, they wear down over time. Now, I want to note something about these practice locks. So one, if you need to lube up a lock, there's actually lube that are designed for locks. Uh, try to avoid WD-40. Like you probably see me if you see my show used in the past WD-40. Um, don't use that for normal locks and especially these progressive locks because while they will loosen and lube up the lock, it will eventually destroy the lock body. So like, don't do that. And trust me, I, once again, I've been working on high security stuff for so long that now I'm like brain dead when it comes to these sort of uh, locks. Let's try it like this. It's not the way to hold it, but yeah, it's like 2 p.m. My brain's not working. <laughs> You're going to see me go through the other ones really fast, though. But yeah, you go all the way up. And I will say this. Um, once you get to four pins, you should be able to pick almost every any single padlock out there, especially the beginner padlocks I'm going to show you. Now, technically, if you get to five pins, you're good with this. But I would say once you especially get to six pins, six of them all in there, you can pretty much pick any door lock. So just wanted to let you know about that. So let's go through the rest of these. What are some, okay, so you've practiced all of these. What are some real world locks that you can practice on? Well, here are my two favorites. They're kind of the staples. This brass boy and this blue beefy boy. These, I call these my brass boys. These are known as, they're from, these are both from Master Locks. We have a running joke that Master Lock, a lot of their products are really crappily done. 
Uh, the reason why master lock is popular is not necessarily that they make good security locks, but because they know how to put their locks in every single store. So everyone buys them. And this is known as a master lock 140. Um, sometimes the, the, the longer shackled ones are 120. That's the same internal ones. Uh, I usually, this is my first go-to for beginners. It only has four pins and it has the common problem that all master locks have, which is that it's usually there's like two Sometimes if you're lucky, one, two, three, four, about two or three of the pins are already like basically right at the shear line. So you're only moving one or two out of the four pins in order to open this. And what's really crazy about, there's two crazy things about the Master Lock 140. One, and by the way, these sometimes come in different colors. Sometimes they have a plastic body, but this sort of like wedge shaped design, that's how you'll know this is the 140 plus it will say 140 on it. And they're usually, the common ones are these brass ones. I see them everywhere in Jersey City. But the two, two crazy things, one, these actually have a piece of security I'm gonna go into is in a second called a spool pin. But because of how badly they implemented the spool pin, it really negates any form of security they actually added to this. So I'm literally gonna go in, hopefully this is a good one. I just move those two pins. And we got an open, I'm sorry, my, my turning tool got in the way. I'll do that one more time. Sometimes that happens, but yeah, no, this is crazy, right? So like I've literally had five-year-olds go for these. So once you get the four pins, the basic four pin on these practice ones, if you have them, if not, you can just buy a 140 and you can go in and you're gonna pretty much feel for two pins and it opens. So that's a very great beginner lock. The Equally easy, the easy in the same category, but in my opinion, slightly harder, ironically enough, is master lock one through three, sorry, one through five. The most common ones are master lock number threes. You have probably seen these everywhere. They're tough under fire. Uh, this is the patented uh, master lock sort of like ri riveted metal slat design. And again, master lock is usually really good of like, if you hit them with hammers, they're not gonna open. But uh, because of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, but their pink core tumblers are freaking awful. In fact, I should have had one with me here. I might have one off to the side. Unfortunately, I don't. Master locks come with a rating system. Master lock number threes are usually rated at two or three, but I've literally bought the master lock number tens, the highest, toughest security, and it's still the four pins with one or two pins off. It's the same core. When they often grade locks for toughness for a lot of these companies, and especially master lock, they're talking about the lock body. Can you blow torch it off? Can you hit it with a hammer? Can you hit it with a crowbar? And maybe some shimming, which I'll briefly touch on. Um, they they're not talking about the core. In fact, they have a hilarious phrasing on these that are called, they say, um, pin core tumbler for uh, lock picking resistance, which to put in perspective for security people, that's like buying a computer and it says, computer has hard drive for anti-hacking. Like implying that just because it has a hard drive, just a standard hard drive, that means it's somehow hacker proof. And it's the same thing where just because you have a pin core tumbler, does not mean you're pick proof and I can prove that. And the reason why I think the master lock threes are a little bit harder and I often see people struggle with them, including my students, is one, the featherweight tension that you do for the 140, very, very slightly more will properly tension this lock. The second thing, and the funniest thing, it's the highest security thing on these master lock number threes are the rivets. Uh, if I put the tension tool, the bottom of the keyway tension tool all the way down and I turn it, it's most likely gonna hit one of these rivets and that way I can't turn it to open. So what I often do when I see these rivets, I just put it about the tension tool halfway into the lock to give that space clearance for the rivet. And actually put it in a little bit more. There we go. So it's the same technique. I'm holding it the right way. I'm gonna put the, the light tension on it and my bottom keyway tensioner in. We're gonna go in and hopefully if this one behaves on camera, and we got an open. Same exact design flaw as the 140. In fact, most master locks have this design flaw on them where they, again, four pins, and then there's like two or three that you have to move and you, you got an open. My hands are cramping up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting older. <laughs> this is what happens when you age. Hopefully some of the people watching this or in chat can relate. Let's try that again. I think I over tension because I, I did like a furrowing of the brow moment. 
Also, there's different ways of holding, by the way, the lock picks. I'm kind of holding it in a stupid way uh, just because that's my preference. Um, honestly, you should probably be holding your lock pick like it's a surgical tool like this and moving it up. I just personally hold it like this with like on the bottom sort of stability just because I'm used to that. But, you know, there's many different ways. I, well, the reason why I went over a specific type of tension is because I guarantee this is the most comfortable, easy way to do padlocks. But that's these two. Uh, again, the master lock 140s and particularly the master lock number three, but one through five will work, um, are really good for real world practice beginner locks. So now that we've gone through that, we're going to cover a little bit more of subjects. What, what other things can we cover quickly with locks today? Well, um, first of all, uh, let's cover. Um, the two types of securities you're going to meet. This is going to, after you go through this beginner stuff and you've gone through your progressive set, if you have them, or you've gone through your master lock one, uh, master lock number three and your master lock 140s, what should, what you're going to, what are you going to encounter next? Like what is actual security on locks? One of the two ways that locks become more secure, like actually not whatever master lock says, is those pins, particularly those driver pins. Remember those, the ones that look like little soda cans that sit on the top of the the, the, uh, the uh, plug tumbler here, you can actually do things with them that will cause the lock to be technically more secure. And those are spool pins and serrated pins. So I'm gonna to try to do a close up on the spool pin one, but you can kind of see it in there. Uh, these look like spools of thread. If you took the thread off them, they're wide at the top, normal wide width at the top of a driver pin, but then they have a thinner middle and then a thick bottom, right? And they look like, again, a spool without thread. And the, why they do that is because it throws off your tensioning. It will put you what's called in a false set where the shear line is going to move when it gets to that little, that like the thinner part of the, uh, of the, uh, the driver pin. So you're going to feel the lock turn because it has that space. You're like, oh, I set that pin. You're going to go through. That pin is still in the way. You haven't set it. So that, that's a mind loop, right? The other one that's, that some find above it are, are what called serrated pins. These look like normal driver pins, but if you can see in here, you'll notice, and I'll actually get a pick and move it up properly. I'm actually just going to pull Sometimes sparrows drive, I got these from sparrows, they drive me crazy with these keys because I can't really line them up correctly sometimes. So I'm just gonna pull both of them out. Uh, but let me take a lock pick here. Let's get a high reach and I'll show you what I mean. So the serrated, I'm just gonna lift it up if I can. There we go. Oh, come on. There we go. So you can kind of see in there, I just lifted that one up. Normal on the top, but you'll notice at the bottom, there's these little cuts in it. Those are the serrades and the serrated. Those will catch the shear line and cause them not to move. And again, I'll give you a better view of that um, spool pin. You see it raised in that middle there. Top, thick on the top, thin in the middle, thick at the bottom. It's, you know, it's a curvy girl, basically, or guy. And so you're probably going to wonder, and I'll do this real quick, how you defeat these. These are all about tensioning. A lot of stuff in lock security is either you don't know the tech, you have the either you don't have the right tool or my favorite, you have the right tool, you don't know the technique. And there's no specialty tools for dealing with these. It's literally a technique. So for the, and I'm going to try to do this as best as I can. I'm going to do this a certain way just to save time. For the, um, oh, I'm going to use top of the keyway for this. For the spool pins, what you're going to do is when it's in that false set, when it's like, I've picked everything, but nothing's moving. What you are going to do is you're going to release the tension slightly. And what and, and while you release the tension, you're gonna push up on that pin that seems loose. And you're gonna know it's loose because if you normally push it without releasing the tension, you're just doing the normal lightweight tension or whatever, you're gonna feel your pry bar, your uh, tension tool push back against your finger. That's called the counter rotation. That's how you go, aha. This is a spool pin. So what you do is when you're like, aha, that's a spool pin, you're going to slightly, slowly, very gradually release the tension off of it as you push up on that pin. And what that's going to do is instead of being it sideways caught on that shear line, it's going to stand up straight. Once it's straight, you push the tension back on because that means you push the pin all the way up and now it's at the shear line. And that's how you do it. And I'm going to try to do this here for you guys live. 
so I can show you what I mean. So this is tricky because again, time limit, and I'm also trying to figure out tensioning here. So that one's loose, which one is probably doing the least amount. Let's try, because it's really hard to do this while also trying to do this for like demonstration purposes, to be honest. But you know, I'm here to teach people. This to me should be public knowledge. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, you're in there. Oh yeah. Oh, over said that one. Let me push that back. Let's see anyone stuck? Okay, I believe we. Oh, darn it. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's how you know we're doing it live. I am not lockpicking lawyer or Bosnian Bill or anything, but I do know my stuff. And they can even tell you that one of the most frustrating things about lockpicking is sometimes you'll have a stupid easy lock, but it's camera, yep, there it goes, open. It's camera shy, <laughs> so it won't open up. Yeah, we noticed that when I got one stuck, I slightly released the tension and then that pushed up. I put the tension back on. I did that for about two or three of these things. And this one completely open because there's nothing with spool pins. One more trick that I forgot to say early enough. If you get practice locks of any type, only turn it about 30 to 90 degrees. Don't turn the plug upside down. Don't spin it all the way around because that will wear out and break the pins and mechanisms in here. And when it breaks, you're going to either have to order a new one or if you're at a tool meeting, we're going to have to repair it. So I'm going to attempt to do this with the serrated. The key to serrated, even if I don't get this on camera, is that each think of each serrated in the serrated as like one pin. So what you're going to do is you're going to feel and hear that click. The pin's going to set. And once it sets, stop, go another pin. Find another one that doesn't want to move. Push that one up. Every click, move to a different pin. And you're just going to keep push clicking and push clicking and push clicking until it works. Now, my issue with this particular one is I think I have to repin it eventually because I have an issue where basically um, one pin, to be honest, for demo purposes is way, way too low. <laughs> so like basically I don't have any proper tool to reach it in the back and that's actually going to be the other quick security technique i'm going to go into um and so i often have to cheat on this one for demo purposes by essentially going through the back and setting that back pin first but that's the basic idea those are going to be the two security types you're going to encounter is the pins sometimes also the keyway might be nuts and what you basically do is get thinner lock picks most lock picks come in at 20 to 25 thousandths of an inch um, that's all you need to know for beginners. This is intermediary stuff. You're going to have to get like what are called 15 thousandths of an inch if you're dealing with European locks or if you're dealing with what's called paracentric keyways or basically keyways that are small and crazy curves. I'm not going to deal with that. I just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, the other way that you'll encounter after you do beginner stuff is the bidding heights. So as I mentioned with that serrated one, and these are two key examples, but I can show you this at the end if we have time. Uh, there's two techniques in pitting, which is uh, low, high, low, and high, low, high. What that means is like for the high, low, high, the two pins or so, let's say it's five pins, the two pins up front are set really high. They're near the shear line, or they might even be over the shear line. Then there's key pins and driver pins that almost are all the way to the bottom of the lock body. And then the two in the back are also high up front, like the one up in the front, which means in order to get those ones in the back, you have to reach around those middle pins that are low in order to pick them. You might overset pins or screw up your order, and that's one way they defeat lock picking. The same thing works with the low, high, low. You have to get around these first pins to get to the middle pins, and then keep going around in order to get those lower back pins. That's another technique. And that's more intermediary stuff. The other thing, as I said, are different lock types. And uh, we're going to go over two unique lock types, and then we're going to get into combination locks real quick, and then we'll do questions. So. Uh, Here's a, here's a padlock, right? This is a Reese coupler. I have it on the blog as recommended. This is a good beginner's lock for this type. But you'll notice that this one, this lock body, this, sorry, this lock core, this opening here, looks different than like this, this master lock number three. Why is that? Well, if you look in, you know how you can see that little bullet at the top? That's that key pin. 
You can't see that in this lock on the left. What? What? Why can't we find any pins? There's no pins in here. Um, this is what is known as a wafer lock. And I'm going to quickly go over here and show a quick video. And hopefully you'll hear me over the traffic on, uh, let's put the mic up. Come on, Mike, Mike. Want to work, Mike? Not Dave, Mike. There we go. Uh, I'm going to do a quick, this is where I go back and forth a little bit. I'm going to do a new screen share. Uh, and I will show you what I mean by um, by wafer locks. Uh, these aren't really tricky, but they do have a unique um, they do have a unique design. And so instead of pins, what you have here are wafers. They're these flat pressed pieces of metal. Um, you'll often find these wafer locks on um, in uh, suitcase keys. Uh, sorry, suitcase locks. And they're very common, if you've noticed, on car locks. Uh, if you ever have a key where the bidding's on both sides, like your car lock, like your, you know, to lock your car, um, that's because it's using a wafer lock system. And again, these flat pieces of metal work similarly to pin and tumblers, except there is no key pins and driver pins. The wafer is all one mechanism. It's just a wafer and a spring. And there's a couple of advantages to this. One, these were came after pin and tumbler locks. These were cheaper. This was supposed to be the future of locks. The other thing, is that you can pin them in different you can uh, uh you can design a wafer lock so they're in different orders you're going to see this key come in this one's bitted on both sides meaning instead of just pushing pins up and down on one side now you have to push and pull on both sides of the key in order to line them up at the sheer line and get that open so that's what wafers are and this confuses people because people think that wafer locks are these like insane complex things that like you're going to need like crazy hacker specialty tools for you don't not only can you pick these with normal um your normal lock pick sets but there's actually a tool that comes with some of these that will make your life way easier for wafer locks and that is these two you, you ever order a lock pick set you're probably like what are these weird circle things in my kit this is known as a half ball sometimes it's a full ball because it's half of a ball, okay, half circle. And this one has a really fun name. The boring name is double balls, ha. But more commonly, because the top ball is smaller than the bottom one, this is often referred to as a snowman because it looks like a little happy snowman. And basically, if you want to put this way, even though you can technically rake a wafer lock with both of these, the half ball is for single wafer picking. The double ball is not only used for raking the wafers, but because it's ball shaped they're circles it's double sided meaning it can do both sides of the lock at the same time and that's what we're going to do with this guy we're going to use the same bomb of the keyway tension wrench right here actually i'm going to use the thinner one because it'll give me a bit more space bomb the keyway tension just like with the pin tumbler lock and i'm going to take this half ball and there's two ridge clicks in here so it's going to take a little bit but it's actually the same setup as this master lock Number four, uh, this master lock 140 and master lock number three. There are four wafers of this, like the way there's four pins. And I literally, two wafers are at the shear line. I just have to move two wafers, just like the master lock, and it opens. So it's the same tension and everything. I'm going to go in. First of all, let me, okay, so I, I am in the right order here. Okay, so I go in. I'm going to move these wafers. So I think that was wafer number one. Almost there. I might have to reset. There we go and an open. So I just poked two wafers in there with this half ball and it just opened right up just like the exact way uh, a, a, a hook or a half diamond would. Now I can't fit the double rake in here, but I am the double uh, ball snowman in here, but I'm gonna use the same pick, just assume it's the snowman. And I'm literally gonna do the same raking technique like I did with those uh, S rakes and the uh, triple peak. I'm just gonna rub it back and forth like it's a toothbrush and it's gonna open. I could even zip it open if I wanted to. So you can use like hooks and half diamonds, especially half diamonds for a wafer lock. But ideally, if you have these balls and half balls, those are for the wafers. It, it makes these really trivial. Like even, even car locks uh, makes them kind of trivial. So another common lock type, you often find these on storage spaces, is here's a master lock. Here's another master lock. These look very similar, don't they? They have the logo down here. It's a similar lock body, but you know this has obviously a little bullet. It's a pin tumbler lock. What the heck is this thing? 
what is this mutant thing? What is this jaggy thing? And like, you stick a lock pick in there. Like, what? You can't, there's no pins. There's no wafers. It just, and it just spins around freely. What, what the heck is this? This, believe it or not, still manufactured today, is one of, if not the oldest lock design ever. This lock design is so old, the Romans used this type of design. They actually had rings that worked as keys. And this is where I'm going to flip back one more time. And this type is, let's go back here, is known as a warded lock. So you'll probably notice it's a similar, similar kind of design as the, uh, that sort of like metal plating as the uh, master lock number three. But what makes this unique and older and much more tougher in terms of the elements because there's less moving parts is that, and I'll show you in a moment, the keys have little spacings in them. They're not bidding. Just have this off camera. Uh, it's not bidding. It's there's spaces and gaps in between the key. And those spacing which fits between the wards in the lock. So some of these flat metal panels are thick and those pass through the spaces of the wards. The rest of them have enough space to go through it. You can see it here. We have the right key that not only fits the shape of the keyhole, you're gonna see it go in. You see how those gaps light up with the spacing of those little slots, right? That's the warding in it, the wards. That allows that to turn freely. And the tip of it engages into that actuator, the thing that, that opens the lock in the first place. So when you turn it, it opens. And that's all it is. There's no pins, there's no wafers, there's no real moving parts. It's just that. And when you turn it, the tip moves and it opens with that actuator and it opens the lock. So if, if this, if there's like no moving parts, let's get back to the uh, Elmo here. If there's no moving parts, and these are tougher than anything, why aren't everything warded is warded locks today? Well. I'm going to show you the keys. As you can see, they have little gaps in them. And you put them in the ward lock. It goes all the way through. Those gaps will pass through the wards. That tip there, see how it's like oddly shaped right there? It engages the actuator that's all the way in the back of the lock. So when you turn it, it opens. And in fact, because of how simple this lock is, you can actually turn it any direction with the correct key, and it will open the lock. Well, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and I'm trying to figure out where I put these, uh, someone developed a very evil, sneaky thing that went somewhere that I am now going to find. <laughs> just give me one moment here. If not, I will just explain the thing. Because some things are unfortunately stuck on this table. There we go. That's where these guys went. Uh, Long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a evil lock picker, probably a disgruntled locksmith, realized that, hey, these warded locks, if you make the, the key body thin enough, it just bypasses all the wards, which means all you have to deal with is that actuator tip. So they collected a bunch of keys and studied the most common actuator tips and made these. These are sometimes er er erroneously labeled warded lock picks. These are more accurately our warded bypass tools. And basically, if you have a set of these, it's game over for pretty much every single warded lock. It works exactly like the key. And they're like tryouts. You go in, um, I'm going to try. There's a, th a shorter one, a thick one. I'm going to do this one, the thick one first. So you put it in, you know, it goes all the way. I bypass all the wards and I bury that tip into the actuator, turn. And that, that wasn't it, unfortunately. So let's let's try the thinner one here. And you just keep trying these out, see if one of them opens. That one's too thin. This means it might be a double pronged one. So it's because of that thick one worked earlier. I'm going to try two thick ones and see if this works. Yep, opened. And I can just forever, I never need the keys again because I can just do that. And it works on all of them. Here's another one. I'm going to do the same process again. I'm going to use one thick one here. This one has like a shackle that goes up and down. Let's see. Okay, that one didn't work. I actually might have to use a thinner one here. Oh, yeah. See? Come on. Open. <laughs> and that's why, except for storage spaces and stuff, you don't 
see warded locks as common locks anymore. Again, you see them in storage spaces. They sell them at Walgreens and stuff. But if you have a set of these warded picks, sometimes they're called, but is they're more like warded lock bypass tools or tryout keys, these, what, one, two, three, five profiles, you never have to deal with them ever again. And that's why we permanently use pins and tumblers and wafers and other things. So the last thing I'm going to go through, and then we'll finally take questions, is you know, pin tumblers, all this picking, that's one half of the lock world. But what about combination locks? Well, this is where things kind of get fascinating. So um, with these, you're going to need a tool that can feel between the wheels because what you're going to do is you're going to feel the gaps in these. I'm going to focus on this one. This is one of the worst locks on the planet. I, 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 I crap you not. Um, and Sparrows calls this the ultra decoder, but a lot of times these are known as combination decoder tools. It has like a thick kind of handheld body here, and it's a thin piece of metal in that weird wedge shape. And it's so thin, super flexible, I can even twang it like that. And what it will do is you can put it between the wheels and you can, there's multiple techniques, but what you can do is Sometimes it's on the left, sometimes it's on the right, but you can feel the wheel. And if it's smooth, that means you go to the next number and you feel the wheel. And as soon as it like goes in, that's the wedge gap. And that way, you know, it's between two numbers. You do that with all the wheels. You try to pull on the shackle. And if it doesn't do that, just flip all the wheels once over and you keep doing that until it opens. Now, if you can't buy this tool, I believe this was 12 or $14. And sometimes at certain manufacturers, they get way more expensive, don't worry. You can literally grab a soda or beer can, cut it in this shape, maybe make a thick bottom portion for you to hold. And while it may only work a couple of times, not only can you decode a lock, but you can do something with this lock that's absolutely inexcusable. This is based off of a design that is known as the Master Lock 175, which I actually do have somewhere, but I'm not going to go get it. And the 175 came out in the 70s. And it's crazy because locks still use the 175 design to this day. And there's a terrible thing where you don't even have to decode the wheels. You don't have to do the tilt method where you put it on the side and do it and feel the wheels or rub on it. You can just bypass this entire lock using basically a thin sheet of metal that you get from a soda can if you don't want to get the professional tool. So what you do here is there's a serial number that faces towards your left. You take this tool. You're going to use the flat end up. And it's the, usually the right of the third wheel. Yep, or maybe I had it. Hold on, let me just double check here and make sure I have it in the right. Okay, sorry, the serial number should be on the left, I believe. And you're gonna put that all the way, should fall all the way into the lock body. Let me just make sure I have this correct. Okay, sorry, I had the wrong angle. It's the left side of the third wheel. Sometimes you have to test for it with the serial number facing left. So that went all the way in the lock body there. You can see it dangling out. Now you don't use the handle. You grab the base of the metal itself. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna push down on the shackle and you're gonna use this bit of metal to move the actuator in the lock out of the way and then the lock opens. So if I did this correctly, it's gonna look like this. We'll put that in there, grab it at the base of the metal, push the shackle down, move the actuator up and it opens. It's faster than using the key or the combination. Here, I'll show you it again. I'll do it how fast, how I normally do it. Oh, it's a 175, huh? Done. Literally bits of metal from a soda can. Also with this particular one, this is a four pin lock, just like the way the master lock is, you need a smaller lock pick, but you can totally pick or rake this open. Uh, funny enough with combination locks, and again, normally you would feel the wheels for it. They did make an upgrade, master lock did make an upgrade away from the 175. This is also another commonly cloned lock. That you find a master lock and other locks. And I, I can't show you what it looks like on the inside because I'd have to take it apart and then it would not work. But basically there are false gates in here. So you can't feel the true gate. So every, so these numbers dip, like I feel a dip right there, but that's not the correct number. Okay. Uh, and if you open up the lock body, there is no way to fit this in here and barely get it past the wheels, but there's no way because it's solid metal to put this in. So I can't do the actuator. The funny thing is you don't need any tool at all to open this lock. All you need to do is pull on the shackle and rock the wheels back and forth. The, if I remember correctly, all the false gates are really freaking huge. So you're going to feel it and it just moves left and right really easy. 
But when you get to an actual true gate, it moves very little. And you just go through all of these. And I'm not going to open it now, but I just try to show you this for time. I have an episode where I did this. And you just rock these back and forth. They're like, oh, that's loose. Oh, that's loose. Oh, that's loose. Oh, oh sorry. It's, it's, sorry. It's rigid. Oh, it's rigid. Oh, it's rigid. Oh, this is loose. That's the real gate. Next one, you go through all of that and opens. You don't need any of this thin metal tools, no lock picks. You just use your hands. So ironically, by over-engineering the security on this, they actually made it even easier and worse to open. Now, the last fun one I want to go through is this guy or gal or them. It's pink. I got it because I don't have any locks that are pink. But this is a common school lock. And this you don't need any tools for. I don't have to, I don't have to take the decoder and feel for it or anything. Um, it's just, uh, you just need your hands. And there's a cool technique that you do. And it all has to do with tensioning the shackle, aka okay, pulling on it and feeling the wheel. So let's see if I can remember and do this right. So what you're gonna do is it's the same method. You're gonna spin it the three times. I believe it's, let me just double check. Yeah, right. You spin it right. Cause I'm not even, I don't even know what the number is. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna spin it three times past the zero, one, two, three, like you would normally. But then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull halfway up on the shackle and you're gonna feel where it catches. And all of these are kind of loose. See how tight that one is? I can barely turn it bet between two numbers. Before I was going between five of them. This one's only two. That means it's near the correct number. So since it's on the correct one, now we count back, uh, was it three? And that's the number. So that there was between these two. So one, two, three, that's the first number. Okay, let's reset this. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go past the, we're going to go to the number properly. So we go past the zero three times and we're going to go to number 13 because that's the one we decoded. And now what we're going to do is we're going to fully pull on the shack all the way up and we're going to go and we're going to feel again, going, turning it left. So all of these super loose, they go past between like three, four numbers each. But this one, if I remember correctly, this one, just double checking. Nope, that one's actually still pretty loose. Sorry about that. We go through. That one also goes between like two or three numbers. But this one, see how it barely goes between a number? That's the correct number on that. So that's like 29 base, sorry, 39 basically. So now we have those. So now that we have those two numbers down, let's reset it. And now we're going to open this lock. So start at zero. So we know the first one's 13. So we'd go past zero three times like you would if, this, if you were a school kid. This is great, by the way, if your kid gets one of these and they get locked out of their locker. And by the way, do not open other people's lockers with this. This is, again, this is for training purposes. Remember those two rules? You'll be violating them. I told you so. So we're going to do 13. And then the next one was 39. So we go right past zero and the original number. We go straight to 39. Now this is neat. So what you're going to do now is we're going to count back four spaces. One, two, three, four. Pull on the shackle. If it didn't open, that's fine. We now go back to each number until this thing opens. So one, two, no open. One, two, no open. One, two, open. And that was the number. That's how you deal with any of these type of master lock combination school locks that are these basic ones you can get everywhere for like two bucks is you pull halfway on the shackle, you feel one, you feel all the loose ones. If one only goes between barely two numbers, that's a good one, count backwards to three. Then reset it, go to the original number, go past, uh, go past, go back to the number on the left, then you pull the shackle full way, you feel for it again, barely between two numbers, second number, reset it, go between those two numbers, and then count on the second number, count back four, pull on the shackle. If it doesn't open, keep counting two back until it opens. And that's how you bypass these with absolutely no tools whatsoever. And that basically covers combination locks. So what I'm gonna do now is we're going to basically, I'm gonna move the camera over and we are going to take questions, but in the background here, cause I'm still gonna screen share, although you'll probably still see my face. Um, I am going to bring up, uh, we have a, I have a blog post that I made about today's uh, 
workshop that went on for 8 million years. <laughs> and um, on that blog post, and I will share the URL, I just want to screen share this first. Let's, uh, why are you doing this? Ah, there are you, there are you, no, there's somewhere on here, hold on. There you are. Um, we're going to screen share back to the, uh, this guy here. I also realized, um, did I actually switch back to the Elmo to show everyone? Um, if I did, if I didn't do that, I can redo that again. So let me know. But basically, I'm going to share this URL, and this has a bunch of recommended tools in a price range. Some of them are, um, some of them are. Uh, I, I usually put the cheap ones first, and then it gets more expensive as you go down. But I wanted to give everyone a range. Again, you can make lock picks out of bobby pins. I can show you that in a moment. Um, you can use windshield wiper inserts, the metal pieces for the tension tools, and it's basically make a, some cheap lock picks for like three or five dollars. Um, but if you want to get an all training kit, you want to get starter lock picks. I especially recommend the um, Southward five piece set here, and the Sparrows kit starter set for super budgeted under twenty dollars. Uh, tuxedo set is a great in the. Uh, 12 piece from Lockpick Extreme are great mid sets. And then I have a list of practice locks, the real world locks. Some of these locks you probably saw on my desk. And um, I have a bonus where you can get cool jewelry for, I guess, if we want to stereotype sexes, men and women, uh, earrings and cufflinks. And uh, two awesome books you can check up. One is by Devin Olam, who's actually the chapter. He's actually the lead of Tool in the United States, was voted an awesome dude, worked with him multiple times. It's not even me talking about, but he really is an awesome dude. And then a really fun book that, uh, it's called Locks and Keys Throughout the Ages, and it teaches you kind of the history of locks and how they were built and modified and all throughout the years. So yeah, uh, to just go over again, I showed everyone um, how a lock works, uh, the exact techniques for a pin and tumbler lock, um, the different types of tools and how to use them. Uh, we went over how you kind of train yourself to learn locks at home, whether it's a practice set or like real world locks you can pra practice on. And then I went a bit over security features and also combination locks. So I see there's already questions in chat, but if there's also people that want to read, um, say out loud questions, uh, that's uh, good. Okay, wow, there's a lot of questions here. Um, oh, better res for low connection. Sorry, I just saw these. I don't have, not only is the computer all the way over here, I, I'm getting new glasses in. So I'm like nearsighted and blind. So uh that's the way we go in. So let's see. I saw, okay. So Queen just asked question says, how does lock picking coincide with IT security? Well, if you've ever been to um, any computer hacker convention like DEF CON or Hackers on Planet Earth, or if you're from Europe, CCC, and or even major IT like Black Hat, the core group, which Deviant Olam also runs, actually I should just go over to my uh, website here, uh, our website, DCG201. Um, you'll often find that there are lock picking villages and or practice areas. And the reason for that is because not only do a lot of professional security people end up getting lock picking as a hobby, there is a lot of crossover because put it this way, um, there is um, like before we ever had computers, this was the OG security stuff that people were worried about were physical locks and safes and doors. Um, in fact, uh, Funny thing enough, um, in the late centuries, I would say between, uh, was it the 15th to 18th century, they used to have conventions. Like, I mean, there are lock conventions, but they used to have conventions just for locks and nobles would participate in it. Um, they would release literal white, what we would call today white papers on how lo certain locks work, how they bypass new inventions of even tougher locks to circumvent uh, previous security breaches. And act, believe it or not, the term full disclosure comes from the lock picking world. Um, so my our whole thing is that one, if you know physical security, you can easily apply that to digital security. It also puts things in perspective because I notice a lot, particularly with people that come from InfoSec, information security, network security, or IT professionals, there's a huge problem that they inherited from the hacker community kind of, which is that you get so caught up with the latest CVEs and VLUNs and stuff like that, that you can't see the forest for the trees. Um, one of my other specialties is being a social engineer. And like one of the frustrations that I have is no company actually teaches what social engineering is and or if they do, they only talk about it in terms of emails. So you have these companies who have like these rigorous 
email social engineering training and they spend all this money on like firewalls and AIs that automatically mitigate and ticket systems and they hire like they poach world class people from Google and Facebook and Baidu and everything. And then I literally put on a sombrero and a Groucho Mars glasses with mustache, walk in physically into the building and walk out with no one noticing all of their top secret paperwork because they're, they're not able to see forest for the trees. They spent so much time getting into the nitty gritty on, oh, we have to cover or mitigate this part of the network, or we have to harden this thing that they don't think, what happens if someone dresses as the janitor and walks into the building? Like, will we recognize that that's not the janitor? You know, um, Devi uh, again, Deviant has a group called Core Group. They're often at Black Hat, um, Black Hat USA, I might add. They do this similar type of training and they do other crazy physical security things. And that's all they do is physical security. And they constantly break into these huge companies. I remember there was one particular one where they had no idea how they bypassed like all of these digital and physical security systems. And what basically happened was someone left an office window open and they forgot that there's an elevator that they didn't use. So they basically went through the window, put the elevator back online, lock picked in order to get the system to work in order to turn the panel on, went in, stole everything and went out and no one didn't notice because since that elevator is not used, they don't actually put cameras there. And this is exactly what I mean by this. So a lot of times when you're dealing with lock stuff, especially with how old this is, and that a lot of this stuff does not get updated again, the master lock number three has not, the master lock padlocks that the number three are based off of literally haven't changed since they first came out in the late, uh, the late, um, sorry, the late 1800s, early, uh, uh, early 20, uh, sorry, um, early 20th century. Like they have not changed. It's the same four pin, everything uh, that, uh, what was I getting with this? that uh, it kind of puts everything into perspective of like, okay, in IT, does everyone know their passwords? Is everyone have 2A? Um, cool, uh, pa passwords compromised. Um, did everyone reset their passwords? This is stuff that you would think people would do, but for some reason, CISOs and lead security people don't even think of these things because they're so busy trying to figure out what Python scripting they use for the, and they forget to do that. And then you have data leaks like what happened at Facebook. Also to note about a company too, make sure if you are a lead of a company that you pay your employees and give them benefits because I have, it's similar to the lock world, I have, it's amazing how places will, um, what do you call it? And I'll get to the other questions in a second. Um, it, it's amazing how so many places, um, and actually I'm gonna just stop screen sharing here just because, um, how so many, how do I stop screen sharing? I forgot how to do this. Um, what do I do? How do? Oh, there it is. Um, you'd be surprised of how many people, uh, you know, think that the way hackers and even physical security people get in is by like some crazy elite hack that no one ever heard of. And believe it or not, most of the time when you hear Google and stuff get breached, it's literally because, oh, wait, they literally pay you minimum wage to do this. We'll give you $30 million. Just give over the encrypted data. Cool. And that's how that happens. <laughs> Again, not being able to see force for the trees. When you do it, lock stuff, it kind of puts you down to earth and get you on the ground level. Plus, to be honest, it's really fun. Um, let's see other questions. How much is the kit? What kit is that one? So the one that I have is this weird mutt. It's a Southward case with random tools that does not come from the Southward company. This is where I'm going to have to screen share again. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, so that one's a mutant. But Again, uh, I have a list on here on our blog about, uh, where is the blog? About different cases. I'm gonna put these links in chat also right now. Um, the two I recommend for super beginners is like cheap start off cases is you have um, the South Ord case, which is $16 plus shipping. It comes with, uh, it's actually the only one co that comes with a ball rake by the way. So the, it will work on wafer locks, but it, what I'm looking for is basic rake, you know, that you use the teeth brushing thing, basic hook or diamond and tension tool. And that's what this has. Plus what's neat is for, you also get a free pamphlet called easy picking. So if you can't remember all the stuff I said today, you have a simple pamphlet reference book in order to do a slightly more expensive, I believe it's $20 before shipping from Sparrows is uh, called the kickstart set. And what I like about Sparrows is all their stuff is modular. So they also sell expansions for these. And same thing, this comes with two rakes, a triple peak and a city rake. Uh, comes with a hook and sort of a weird hybrid hook thing and all the tension tools. And it's basically $20 and a nice, and Sparrows is known for their cases, really good quality cases. 
Um, I will also note, because this is a thing, if anyone is vegan out there or is just iffy about stuff, Sparrow's cases are made out of nylon and South Ord. You can actually get vegan cases, aka fake leather cases from them. Just putting that out there. If you want a more comprehensive one, again, all of these are great, but probably the most bang for your buck, again, from Sparrow's, and I'm not sponsored by any of these or from Sparrow's. These are just stuff that I actually use, is the Tuxedo, where honestly, you get a huge range of everything that you need. Like if you're going to really get into this and like buy practice locks and stuff, um, it has multiple different types of rakes, multiple different types of uh, hooks. And it actually also comes with that thin 15 thousandths of a hook. So when you deal with things like the American lock with its tinier keyway and all of its security pins, um, you can uh, you can actually start dealing with those and start advancing to the intermediary. Anything that I list in this blog post will work. I will post the whole blog in chat right now and I'll deal with the other questions. I thought I was gonna get verbal questions. This also has a list of practice locks pretty much whether you get them from Sparrows, Tool, or Lockpick Extreme, they're all great. And any of the real world locks, all these locks you see here, except for the cylinder one, I have it somewhere, I just don't have it on me, um, are all the locks that you saw on the table that I have, plus just cool bonus stuff. Um, let's see if there's any more questions here. I'm gonna do this, uh, there's my there's my mug next to the payphone, because back in the day, I'm old enough that I used to do red boxing, go look it up. And that's not a physical boxing style, that's a technical term. Um, let's try to wrap this up with more questions. God, I had so many questions. Um, let's see. I th Welcome to Jersey City, or just random music. Uh, I think that taught me at Tool. Yes. Okay, cool thing. Thank you for bringing it up because I forgot to mention here. Um, another thing about the tensioning, right? If you are using top of the keyway, bob the keyway, it doesn't matter. Use a tension tool and you're pressing it. And you're like, oh, I can't get this open. You know how you know you're doing way too much tension? Flip it around. Look at your finger. If it's turning white, you're, you're tensioning it too much. Release that tension. If your finger where the tool meets turn, starts turning white because you're cutting off the circulatory, you're putting way too much tension on a lock most of the time. So yeah, if your figure changes color when you're tensioning like that, relax. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it up. I actually completely forgot to do that because again, it is 259. This is the moment I would be normally waking up. Uh, let's see. What do I need to look for a kit for work and trading? Okay, so trading and work are two different things. Also, here's the problem. It's the same thing with digital security. If you're trading for something or you're doing it for work, what is your threat model? I actually did an episode of Master of Unlocking where Similar to hackers, there's kind of like three groups of hackers and then everything's like a mixture between the two and they all have their own subcultures. It's the same thing with lock picking. And I broke it down that there's like three different types and there's all these different sub communities in them, which are all mixes of the three different types. They're all Zadies. So, and they're all based after their threat model. What are they trying to do? Um, a lot of lock sporters are interested in the mechanics of the lock. They see them as puzzles. In fact, there's another sub sub subcategory who just deal with puzzle locks. Um, well, a lot of us just like it because we like the challenge. We think it's a neat thing. We like figuring out how things work and what's the exploits and stuff. And some of us, again, also enter in competitions, which is its own field. It's kind of like esports, but with locks. It's crazy. Um, and, but then you also have, for example, um, just like that. You just you have uh, like uh, locksmiths, and most locksmiths don't even carry all this fancy stuff. They literally carry a tension wrench and a hook. And sometimes they carry a rake. It's usually a triple peak. And that's it. That's all they need because normally they're, they're installing locks or they just drill right through it or knock it off with a hammer. They don't need, as one lock, locksmith put it, fancy lock picks. Those are more designed for um, lock sporters. Uh, you know, what is your threat model? For example, if your facility has, which they shouldn't because these are terrible, um, have Bluetooth locks. Yeah, invest in like, you know, attaching to a lock hook, maybe a couple of rakes, like I would say a city rake and uh, like a triple peak Bogota or even an S rake. Uh, but then like get go to like red teaming tools. I forget the URL. I'm actually gonna look that up right now. But a red teaming tools, again, deviant all of, that's the problem with physical security and lock picking world. It's not really a problem. It's just more of that, uh, the dudes everywhere. Like again, one of the books I recommend, he literally wrote the book on lock picking. So, you know. Welcome, Deviant. You are our God. Um, 
So cool. He did blue boxing back in the day. But yeah, you go red teaming tools, go to their physical security section and get RFID scanning tools <laughs> because you have Bluetooth locked. You probably don't even need to pick them. You just probably have to put in either a, like a, just all zeros or one, two, three, four, five, and they'll all just open. They, there's been talks at DEF CON and Black Hat just about those things, which is why no one recommends them. Also, we hit another reason why you shouldn't get Bluetooth automated locks like the Kivos and stuff from Quickset. Um, is because most of the time, if that lock doesn't work and you call a locksmith, the first thing a locksmith is going to do is they're going to drill through it. And those locks have batteries in it, meaning when they drill through it, at worst, they're going to get battery acid sprayed all over the locksmith. At, at worst, if the battery is still active, it's going to electrocute them. So, no. Um, but yeah, if that's your threat model, um, you know, what if you're, you know, what if you're a spy and escape artist, you might want to get the cufflinks that I have on that listing. You might want to get something from Sparrows called a Nightcrawler, which is a miniature kit that can easily blend in and fit in your pockets. You might want to reach out and get, maybe you might want to get custom lock picks from someone like Kilimaru, who I recently interviewed, who does concealed type stuff. It really just like with, with digital security really depends on who are your user base and what's your threat model normally is. Once you know that, you will know the pick set that you will use. Again, that's why everyone's EOD carry is different. In fact, if you go on YouTube and you search like Deviant Olam's EOD carry or search lock picking, uh, um, sorry, EDC, EOD, EDC, or I'm thinking of the bombs, but ECD, here we go. <sighs> Brain. Um, you know, if you search uh, lock picking EDC or lock picking everyday carry, you will see videos of just people going through their everyday carry carries and you'll quickly realize what sort of threats they have to deal with or what they use their hobby for. So. That's why I brought that up. Um, so let's see. Question, does refrigerant, refrigerant really work if you spray into the keyhole? It depends. Okay, so what you're probably thinking of, and it's in my room and I'm kind of too lazy to get it. I did an entire episode about this. There was a device, I think you can still buy these, but they're very uncommon now. They used to be really popular on Zinger called the Club. It is a wafer lock. I literally picked it on air. It was stiff. I sprayed some DW40 because that actually works with that lock, but I put some lube on it move two or three wafers and it instantly opened. The newer ones have trickier wafers, but they still open in like four seconds. There were multiple ways where you didn't even have to pick it and bypass it. One of them is essentially the metal is so brittle and some really crappy locks are like this, um, like Brinks locks are notorious for this, is you could spray it with coolant and it freezes and you hit with a hammer and it shatters. Now that will might be a fast way to get in, but I will say again, your threat model. Even though sometimes you can hear the lock being picked, single pin picking or quickly even raking a lock will produce way less sound than if I just rammed through the door or if I froze the lock and knocked it off. So that would be great if you want to just enter in and like beat someone to death or something. I'm not saying you should, I'm saying threat scenario. But if you're like trying to be like James Bond here, you know, sneaking through, um, you don't want to make sounds like that. So you wouldn't want to freeze a lock and break it. In fact, funny thing about Brinks locks, there's a hilarious video where you can you can open certain brink locks by just either tapping with a hammer or my favorite getting the same brinks lock and tapping them just bink and they both open so sometimes you don't even need to freeze them you just have to hit them really hard they just open like they don't even break they just open so that that used to work back in the day i will say now a lot of locks like for example this one, even though this is really crappy in terms of picking and bypasses, this has what's called a boron carbide shackle and the shape of it, it's resistance to shimming and you're not gonna freeze and break this. You're not, this is also gonna take you like probably like at best 10 minutes at worst, like a half an hour to an hour to blow torch through this. And there's other even more high security locks that are even more impossible to do things like that. Um, someone asked, I'm from Northern New Jersey. I just joined the local NJ chapter. Congratulations. That's actually the chapter I'm part of, even though I normally go between the New Jersey chapter and the New York chapter. Um, I'm going to assemble a beginner's kit based on your Rex. Any meetups in the pipeline for DCG 201? Yes. So <laughs> as I said, ever since the combination of everyone is licking people's doorknobs while plague's going on and You've seen the news with police. Um, we've been live streaming our own meetings. And again, we have our own shows. I do the Master of Unlocking where I do this sort of stuff. I have a really crazy one tomorrow I'm going to end off with. And uh, and we have other shows like our co-founder, G.I. Jack, talks about Arch Linux. And he also plays video games on Linux. Um, we have a new show we just launched called Circuit Breakers where we do this type. It's like this, but with hardware. So we actually take things apart and solder things. Um, 
and sometimes we do specials. Uh, so just all I would say is pay attention to our social media, pay attention to our website, pay attention to our blog and meetup page. Uh, I'm going to type in those URLs right at the end. Um, I will say so if you want to see a nuts thing that I'll go into at the end, um, tune in tomorrow at 8 p.m. Uh, on Twitch D Live or YouTube, just uh, twitch.tv slash DEFCON 201 Live. YouTube, you just type in DEFCON. Same thing with DLive, DLive.tv slash DEFCON. We have a link tree that I'll post at the end that has all these links. Um, and uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you can catch me for Master of Unlocking for this month. And again, it happens uh, first and third Sundays. Uh, so that's what we have in the pipeline. Our next meeting is in May, third Friday of every month. It is, I believe, May 21st. And we can't announce anything because a lot of these meetings, we plan months in advance and we try to mostly finalize things before we announce them. But I forgot to say this yesterday, but basically what we've been doing a lot is we've been trying to make um, physical things a virtual reality. And next month, we're going to try to really mean it. Also, because now New Jersey's opening up, we wanted to wait a month to see if we would have to close down again because people are rubbing each other's butts together and things during a plague. So uh, uh, we're going to try to do limited in-person stuff. In it. We're still live streaming, but we just want to test the orders for that. But we don't have any concrete details. We're still working on that. So again, just pay, pay attention to our website, social media. But thank you for asking. And welcome to uh, uh, Tool Ed J, as it's called. Um, there's also locks and server cages during physical audits. Import. Yes, again, your physical servers, a lot of your hardware, your keyboards and stuff probably have wafer locks or physical locks on them. I've actually opened those type of things on the show. Lock picking seems like trivial. Also, what I love about lock picking is because it's, it's always done horribly wrong in movies, but it's really popular movies. People think it's like movie magic bullshit that this is like a fake thing that doesn't exist in real life, but it does. They just don't show the real thing because either their research is incompetent or more accurately, similar to explosives. They don't show the real thing because they don't want to teach every single teenage dipwit in the audience how to do all of this, even though you could just go online and find lockpicking lawyer and stuff. Um, let me just see if there's any new things. Uh, who is this, our Lord and Savior? That would be Phoebe the Squirrel because that's how old I am. So, yeah, uh, again, a recap here, I guess uh, we, uh, you know, one, safety third. But two is that, uh, yeah, we did um, we did a lot today. Uh, we, I covered and I hope everyone understood. I hope this video turned out fine. I'm probably going to get yelled at by everybody uh, of how, like, basically how lock mechanisms work, why we can exploit lock mechanisms, how we do that with what tools. We have single pin picks uh, and we have rakes. Showed the techniques for both of all of those. We worked, this, we worked on some practice locks, even though my hands were all bleh, so I couldn't do it. Uh, we, uh, we showed some uh, real world locks that we picked. And I also taught kind of the beginning of when you finally get into security pins and also how to decode combination locks and what tools or techniques you use for that. So that's, and I showed everyone here the type of lock pick tools you could get. Uh, so uh, is there any more questions? Is anyone, by the way, uh, if anyone's in here and has questions, uh, I don't know if this is allowed, but you can, uh, in my opinion, you can unmute your mic and just tell me the question. I don't mind that unless you want to be really covert. Thank you for enjoying the presentation. Um, I will, I guess, go off on one thing, uh, one last thing, one more thing um, that uh, before I do the ending spiel. So you've probably seen this. I'm not going to do the other camera. I'm just going to do this. So you probably see this master lock. This is the master lock number three. This one looks very similar to it, but there's a big difference. Uh, this is basically a clone of the master lock number three from China. But what's weird about it is that the Chinese one is an older model. The newer ones, despite how crappy and easy they are to pick, um, they have on the, sh the shackle and I'd have to pick it to open it again. But basically they use ball bearings. That's why you can't shim the shackle on these. That again, if you wanna know that, you could go check out Master of a Lock. So I'm not gonna do that today because we're focusing on lock picking, not really bypasses. But if we're allowed to do one more piece of a bypass. These have the older locking pole system. They're little wedges that hold them. They're not ball bearings. So there's a subsect, so there's a subset, uh, they're vertebral to these. Uh, Sparrows calls these the master switch. A lot of times these are known as the master lock bypass. And they basically manipulate the locking poles at the same time. So what you do is you take the talon one, the claw one, and you push all the pins that are up away. And you slide that all the way in the back of the lock until it just, it digs in back there. And basically if I do this right, eh, 
it just stays there. It's not going anywhere. Let me just, for some reason, it's been having more tricky to deal with. So uh, come on, get in there. There we go. So that's in there. So you take the other one and you put it in the reverse at the bottom. Provided I did this right. And now these should be in. And if I did this right, if I wiggle these back and forth, it should open and I did do them right. So hang on. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what's been going on with this one. This one just does not want to lock in properly half the time. Nope. Hang on. Ah! And it just opened by itself by accident. So that also shows you how crappy this, this lock is. Okay, so that, I believe I got that in there. Here we go in the other way. Other way. And then when I wiggle these back and forth, they should just pop open. I think. There we go. See? Open. And that's what master locks used to be like, I think, uh, uh, before the millennium, like before like 2002, maybe 2006. And now they have the ball bearings, so this doesn't work anymore. Just wanted to leave with that. Um, unless anyone wants to me to quickly show how you make this stuff with bobby pins, I think we're, we're pretty good with that. So, uh, hey, so anyone... si hey, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I could hear you, Socks. Sweet. Um, got a quick question. First of all, I want to say, hey, thanks for coming out and, and doing this amazing presentation. I, I've enjoyed it. Um, second question, do you have an example of a snake lock that you can show? Unfortunately, I don't yet. Uh, I'm constantly limited by two factors. One, money. I actually debated of putting my uh, cash app in here if, you know, to rattle the can. Um, but the other thing is, uh, cause I built this all myself. This is like pretty much most of the stuff is my own money. I've also had minor donations in the past from local members, um, including locks they don't need. The other problem that I have is I'm waiting for every locksmith to go on strike soon because, uh, there's parts from China that thanks to the old sanctions for the past four years would take forever. I literally one time ordered, it was a tubular lock trading set that I, that I used for presentations. We're not covering that today though. Um, I did an entire episode on it for Master of a Lock. If you want to check that out. Um, I literally ordered it in January and it literally stayed in customs until May. And what's crazy was I signed up for all the notifications for uh, uh, UP, uh, USPS and uh, the United States Postal Service. And they didn't even send me the notifications. It just showed up randomly. I didn't know. I thought I may have lost it forever. And now thanks to, I hate being political, but now thanks to DJOY, <laughs> Uh, everything is like going through customs. So yeah, like, yeah, everything. Literally order stuff in now. Things that would normally come in like five to six days now come in in two weeks, and I'm like, everyone's going insane. So unfortunately, due to to mainly money and the fact that I might get a snake one just for my own personal thing, because I do have a couple of locks in my kit that are designed to be absolutely mind-numbingly annoying because I occasionally have people at the meeting show up who are like, yeah, no, I do. It's security pins all the time. And I'm like, here's this house of Abeloy. I don't get to see you for two days. And like, th I have those. But um, but most of my stuff is literally for like certain base lock concepts. Like my training method is I get a clear, clear or cutaway version of a type of a lock system. Um, then I have um, either a progressive set or super easy real world examples. And I have the tools for them. So like, for example, the tubular lock one, I have a clear tubular lock with its key. I have a practice tubular lock that I've had to modify in order for it to work because there's a whole thing about tubular locks where you have to make custom practice ones. And then I actually have the um, impressioners and the picks for those tubular locks. And that's how people learn. They get to see what it looks like on the inside with the normal key how the actual bypass and or picking works. And then they try it on a practice one and they try it on one or two real ones. And I have that for every single type, whether they're wafer locks, warded locks. Here's some that are in the work. Uh, it's okay if you don't know these terms. Just detainer, cruciform, multi-pick. <laughs> Take your pick. Um, that's kind of my methodology. So I, I might have a snake one just to be like, for all the experts out there, here's a strange one you can try. But unfortunately, I don't have one to display for today. Hopefully, either before the end of the year or early next year, I'll probably get a snake lock along with finally a Mr. Leashy tool and other things. Like oh, wow. That. Okay. Like, okay. I, I know what you're talking about. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, anyone else in chat or anyone in here wants to ask questions? If there's any questions from YouTube, if anyone's even watching on YouTube, it, be, who's ever in charge can relay those. Awkward silence. Okay. I actually will. I know I keep saying one more thing, but this is literally the one more thing. 
I will very quickly go over the bobby pin thing again, just because I'm very consciously aware that this thing that this hobby can get in skill set can get very um very expensive very quick. So I'm actually going to do one last screen share and switch it over to the uh, Elmo and show this. And again, this might not perfectly work, <laughs> but uh, but uh, this is actually how you do it. So let me move the mic closer again. So if you are completely broke and you don't have, like even if you don't, you don't even have the windshield wiper inserts, you just, you don't have anything, just go out, spend $2, get an entire huge pack of Bobby pins. These are not exactly the best ones as I found out later, but they, they mostly work. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna try this on the clear lock. So here's how you do this. So first you're gonna you're gonna take two bobby pins out. I actually need to get rid of the black on black on black, just like with crime. That's not good. So uh, unless it's like you know, coolness. So you know, <laughs> yeah, it's just like a black on black crime. Black on black on black in terms of color balance, not great. Everything disappears. Same thing with white on white. So I'm gonna take two bobby pins. Your first bobby pin you're gonna make the tension tool. Now, uh, ideally you'd want to use a pair of pliers. This is a multi tool lent by. Uh, uh, DCG 201 member Cirrusel, who's currently in the building, probably napping. If you don't even have that, you can take the lock you're going to pick and you're going to take the round end. That's what you're going to be focusing on here, the part that actually loops, not the two independent ends that spread apart, the round end. And I'm going to do another focus. And you're going to stick that in the lock that you're going to pick. And that's the other problem is that I don't know if this is properly wide enough to do that. Yeah, this one's not properly wide enough. Let me get one that's a wider, potentially wider keyway. None of them might be. That's going to drive me. Ah, it's going to drive me nuts. I'm going to use the wafer one. I just see. This is why I don't like these because these are a little bit too thick. Uh, he's a little bit thicker than I want to. So, but normally you can actually stick a thin bobby pin, the round part, into the lock body and bend it to make the the bottom of the keyway tension wrench. We're going to use a pair of pliers instead. So you're going to take that round part. You're not doing these tips, not these beaded rounded tips that spread open. We're going to use the rounded portion here, and we're going to go where it kind of tapers to that first hump. That should be enough for a tension. We're going to grab that. We're going to. Hopefully this doesn't break. We're going to try this. Yep. Come on. You can do this. It's also really tiny pliers. Uh, and that's basically your bomb, the keyway tension tool. You can probably make that a little bit more into an L. And again, just because these are not the best bobby pins, these might not quite work, but that's how you make the tension tool. The way you do the pick, is and this is the annoying part is basically you have to break these in half um or you can actually you might be able to certain ones you might be able to bend mostly straight uh so actually sorry you're going to bend this and what we're going to do i'm actually going to take out one more bobby pin because what we're going to attempt to do is we're going to attempt real quick to create both a pick and a rake so what you've done is i've made i've opened this to an l and then what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the straight end, because this will be our pick. We're going to take our pliers. We're going to make a hook out of it by bending this up. That's it. And that's our pick. And then, by the way, if you want to be extra fancy, you can take the other end. And you can curve it completely around. And that just gives you a little bit more. Let's bend it a bit more. Ah, did an entire episode about this. A little bit more of a handle for you to use while picking. Now, to do a rake, it's even easier. And this is the part. So, what you're going to need is pliers and scissors for this, by the way. So, we're going to bend it in the same L shape. And instead of focusing on the thin part, we're just going to focus on the wavy part. So, we're going to take the thin straight part and we're going to do the same curve because that's going to be our handle. Ah, right there. Kind of. That's the best we're going to do for now. There we go. And the cool thing is that the wavy part is already in a rake shape. And that's where we're going to go and we're going to get the scissors. And this is the part where I am going to walk over here and I'm going to put on eye protection um, just because these are bobby pins. Things might go flying around everywhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our, this is our rake and I'm just going to pop the tip. So it's the first wave, like the valley of the first wave. Oh, I might actually, need, ah, I know I need. 
these are too thick, so I might not need, yeah, I'm gonna need that. So I'm gonna have to borrow this, hang on. Uh, or, hold on, might have these, oh, these actually I think are built in, the wire cutters. You're gonna need pliers and, a, and wire cutters, if it, and the wire cutters if it's too thick, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna snip this at this wave here. There we go, that piece went flying. So now I have a nice, like basically a four peak or triple peak here. Not the highest waves, but that usually works. And then for the pick itself, I'm just gonna snip the tip off of this little bulb at the end. And now that is our pick. And I'm just gonna, yeah, I think this is bent enough. So what we have here is we have a turning tool. We have a single uh, shallow to mid range hook. I can make it at any height by bending it. And we have a rake. So just by using three bobby pins, I have made uh, really flimsy, but these should work as lock picks. And we're gonna try this. And again, the, the biggest problem is going to be the, there we go, kind of. So I put that at the bottom and that, that should be able to tension this, right? And I know it looks odd, but this is DYI here. And then I can go in with my pick if I can fit it. And I might have to use a little bit of finesse here, but I can actually go in. Again, these are not the best bobby pins. <laughs> yeah, I should be able to go in and, yep, and, yep, set that one. Yep, I overset that one. <laughs> Let's do this, different tension here. But I can go in and I can move each of the individual pins. I'm gonna actually try the rake on this one see if it even opens. And again, my goal is not to get this to work per se. It's more of a, just showing you how this would work. Cause again, these aren't the best bobby pins. I realized that when I did the episode about them, actually with this guy, I realized I made a boo-boo just because of the way these are shaped. I, these might break off when I do this, but I'm going to bend this the other way to make a better handle. Oh. Like that. I, I opened this once with this, and again, these aren't these aren't going to be like your best picks, but almost there. But they uh, they do work. I have opened these with bobby pins, and the reason why you're not going to see this work on the video has nothing to do with that. This technique doesn't work, and has everything to do with that. Unfortunately, I bought bobby pins that were way too thick. They're like more stylized, and they are functional but you can do those. So again, uh, if you can't buy, you can't do $16, $20 plus shipping with picks and all of this stuff, you can just get your uh, master lock 140 or master lock number three. You can get them individually for probably like eight, but roughly eight bucks, five to eight bucks. And then with three better bobby pins than these, try to go for more thinner ones. Um, you can make a tension wrench by just bending the curved part. You can then take another one make a little handle, take the straight edge, curve that into a pick and take the wavy end, curve that and make that into a rake. And those are the three things like what you basically you made the equivalent of a tension wrench, a hook and a wave rake. So yeah, that's how you can do it super cheap at home. So again, I know what it's like from buying all this stuff and trying to break the bank. Um, you don't need to break the bank for this if you smartly shop or if you have a couple of tools at home and you have things like bobby pins and kids of soda, you can make your own um, You can make your own picks for really cheap. Also fun fact, not it's not in this episode, but um, the whole other universe, which if you want me to invite me on for, I can do is gutting, taking apart locks, taking the pins out, putting new pins in and stuff. Um, I have pinning mats, but if you don't have pinning mats, you should do this with the pinning mat anyhow. Just take a bowl or a sheet pan, anything that has like sides, and you take a piece of cardboard and you put it in there and you peel off the first layer and those ridges, you can put all the pins and screws and stuff on so they don't roll away. And that's how you do that without spending like 20, 40 plus dollars on a rubber mat. That's all. So uh, apparently all questions were answered.
Um, again, I want to thank um, Laxa Cybersecurity for letting me for ramble for, for two and a half hours and letting everyone fall asleep uh, watching this presentation. Um, I will do one last um, screen share just to do kind of my spiel. I know I said the last one was the last, but I lied. Um, you can contact uh, me personally. I am on uh, mastodon.social. Um, just search for, uh, was it uh, Side Pocket? I'm also on Instagram at Side Pocket Reborn. So you can contact me personally that way. Um, I'm not on certain, certain multi, uh, social media, not because of any privacy thing, but because apparently no one can stand me on those and bo booted me off. Um, you can again catch my show, The Master of Unlocking. It happens the first and third of every Sunday on our live stream stuff. I'm actually going to type the um, URL to both the website. So this is the website, defcon201.org. And uh, this is a link tree, which is uh, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash -E DEFCON 201. We also have some of these on our website where you can find our Twitch D live and YouTube. I will be on our live stream tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And basically uh, one of my roommates got a computer where not only do they have to, we're gonna repair, we're gonna attempt to try to repair the computer again because it broke again, but it has a built-in combination lock. It's one of the most infamous features. And uh, we're going to see how well this lock holds up. I already know the answer, but if you wanna know how well this laptop, built-in laptop lock holds up, it's a combination lock. Uh, you just have to watch and find out. And of course, uh, where was I here? Um, yeah, and that's our website, defgodtua.org. Um, and you just uh, pay attention. Again, we meet third Friday of every, uh, uh, dcg201.org, I'm sorry. Uh, we meet uh, third Friday of every month and uh, hope to see you at uh, future meetings. Oh, one last quick thing. Sorry, this popped in my head. Um, you know, remember back when I said uh, that uh, uh, why you should learn how to pick locks, uh, like someone said, like how it relates to IT? Um, one of the great things about lock picking, by the way, and again, don't pick locks that you don't own and stuff. Sometimes I've had permission from other people to pick their locks due to emergencies, like they've locked their cats in or something like that. And um, one of the crazy things that can happen is you kind of find out how good or not good uh, your locks actually are. So if I'm able to find this, this is a quick snippet from uh, one of the episodes that I did where uh, I had to change my neighbor's locks because uh, someone lost their keys. So I had to change their back door lock and the front door lock. And uh, because they didn't need those locks as I put new locks in with better security, um, they let me keep the old locks. So I did an entire episode testing uh, how secure or not secure their lock is. And this is the front lock. And I, I, if this plays properly, I kind of want everyone to see, come on, how fast I got through this. So here I am figuring out the tension. So I, re I, I realized I was tensioning too tight. So I did a different type of tension right now. That was their old front door lock. Notice I got how fast I got in there. That was about four to six seconds. And that was their old. So they were like, when they saw that, they were extra happy and excited that I replaced the door locks with better security. Uh, because, and I've done this too. I really found out really quick how good or bad building locks are for people um, just by having people telling me permission of, hey, we're gonna we're gonna replace the locks anyhow. We want to know if the old ones are crappy, so we know if not to buy from them again. I do it, and they usually have horrific results. So just want to share that real quick. Otherwise, again, you can check us out at defgod21.org, and I hope to see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Master Unlocking on our Twitch D Live or YouTube. I uh, hope you learned a lot today, and I uh, hope you have a pleasant um, pleasant night. And as we say at GCG 201, uh, hack the planet and Dirty Jersey represent. It's been an honor. Uh, to ramble and bore you all to death on um, Blacks of Cybersecurity and uh, kind of speechless that this even happened. So it's, thank you. It's really been an honor to uh, teach uh, my hobby and my, my craft, something I enjoy uh, personally doing. This is not my day job, but that I actually do with uh, all of you out there. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today and we'll be signing off. Yep.